What's up, Mike? Hey, Kirk. Welcome to my apartment and to the America Show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, thanks for coming over and your cool BMW bike. That's right. That was pretty cool. And you keep trying to get me to get my Harley back. Yeah, we need to put together an <laughs> objectivist writing group, I think. Although, well, it sounds like you said writing group. I think right. we have that. We have plenty of those. We have we plenty need writing, of those. Writing groups. Yeah, yeah, we need some writing groups. So my problem is, um, one, you would smoke me in that thing. Even in my Harley was pretty, you know, it, like I've seen some speed things with Harleys mm -hmm. where they do pretty well long distance, but man, they don't go they don't fast. The, <laughs> Their acceleration is, the acceleration. is yeah. not good. It's yeah. kind of embarrassing. Yeah. Well, I, I have good uh, good acceleration. I don't, my top speed isn't too impressive, but okay, yeah, yeah I think. The I mean, it's not it's not really a, a, that bike is more the aesthetic than the yeah yeah the performance. So. No, it's a cool bike for sure. Um, okay, so I wanted to start off by so you are an associate fellow at the Ayn Rand Institute, correct? But your day to day job is actually as a professor or a teacher of sorts at the university uh i guess you could say that i mean i split my time between a number of things for ari i guess if i were tracking hours meticulously most of my time would be spent for aru related tasks okay grading teaching prepping office hours with students planning lesson lesson planning that kind of thing so but you're also doing new ideal you're doing ocon talks Yes. Things of that yeah. nature as well. Yeah. Where do you think most of your time goes? If um, you had to add it up. Well, right now, most of it goes towards ARU. So I'm teaching a course um, on uh, reasoning. Um, I'm grading for the course on objectivism being taught by Ankar Gatte. I'm doing office hours with students in both. Uh, doing we have an assignment called a tutorial assignment where the students write a longer paper and then meet Thought one of them. Tutorial? Tutorial. Tutorial, okay. Tutorial, yeah. um, <clears throat> and the students meet with us one-on-one -on -one and talk about their papers. So I, I do, uh, I guess, about one of them a week. Okay. Yeah. So, so my first big question, and I've thought about, you know, I've had my own thoughts about this for a long time. I'm not a PhD. I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a professor. Mm. What is a philosopher today, do you think? Today, um, I mean, in terms of if you look at the people who make money and their jobs as philosopher, they're university professors, yeah. almost without exception. I mean, you could, the exceptions would be people in sort of think tank, niche think tanks like us, I guess, um, is I'm not a university professor. Um, and there are people who I would consider philosophers who aren't teachers. Alex Epstein, I think of you consider a, Alex a Alex philosopher? Is, a, is a philosopher. Yeah, I, I think Why that's, do you, that's interesting. So Alex Epstein is the author of the moral case for fossil fuels, fossil future. Mm -hmm. I know he refers to himself sometimes as a philosopher. I think that's fair. Um, but, I mean, but people uh, like Sam Harris, I would think of as he might not hmm. call himself that, but what he does yeah i mean he wrote a book on free will he wrote a book on uh secular justification for his moral views like that, that's hmm. philosophy um and then he writes about um cultural trends and what drives them and he, sometimes he's pretty good and philosophical and deep other times he's kind of not but i mean it's, <laughs> i still think of that as well, doing philosophy and but, but th those are those are the exceptions not not the rule most people who are professional philosophers are university professors yeah so i i guess i'm trying to distinguish between philosopher and intellectual mm -hmm. like professional intellectual and i do think there's a clear difference like uh, i remember listening to onkar once and even and even ben when they were talking about free will and they talked about it quite differently than mm -hmm. sam harris even does mm -hmm. you know for them they were especially ben who i think knows quite a bit about and both of them do, but that's their specialty, I believe, or to some degree, right? For Ben Bayer, I think he's he, epistemology was what he got his special his uh, when he was a uh, in in PhD. university, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, one of the things that Ben and both uh, and Ankar did was they 
were able to put Sam Harris's unique argument, which is the video that I, I'm referring to. Mm-hmm. They did a video on Sam Harris, did some new argument, and they put it in the context of like the history of philosophy. And they were saying that here are arguments, and it's really not that different, but he is actually doing something unique here mm-hmm. with the. And that sounds that seems very different than like what Alex Epstein does. And there's so, so there seems to be something very unique about a philosopher, or maybe that's just history of philosopher. But like the, like I think Ankar once put it as a, um, you know, like he he thought about going into law school, mm-hmm. and this was like an alternative. And there's similarities in that in certain regards, in this regard, I think. The similarities between philosophy and like like putting law. yeah like understanding the arguments, who's made those arguments, mm-hmm. what's new or different or old hat about this argument. Well, yeah, right? what's what's similar about philosophy and the law is that it's you know self consciously about argumentation. Uh, at least that's part of what philosophy does is, um, you know, try and make all of the assumptions explicit and check them and argue about the, you know, are these assumptions true and just similar things go on in, uh, in, in the law where you make a, you know, there's certain things that are assumed for a case and then you reason from them and then you know, so should we assume these things and, um, so there's there there are some similarities there, but the reason I think Alex is a I think of Alex as a philosopher is especially in his more recent work when he's talking about um, I think is he, what is his terminology the knowledge system um, yeah. how knowledge is generated and then disseminated through the culture I mean that's um, if he were a professor, he would. They would say he's doing social epistemology. I mean, basically, what, mm. what they would call that. So there's actually a name for that thing, and he has. You know, he's has interesting things to say about it. They're original, as far as I know. I'm not a, um, an expert in the history of social epistemology, but it seems novel, um, plausible uh, claims he's making about how that works, and then he's. Um, diagnosing problems in the culture and in, well, specifically in the dissemination of knowledge about climate. Um, and that's, you know, generating a view of how knowledge is generated and disseminated through a culture and then applying that view to the contemporary to, or to a contemporary, um, yeah, issue. That's, that's philosophy in a, in a sense is very, I mean, that's kind of what you see in a lot of, uh, Ayn Rand's essays. She'll, sure. she'll talk about some abstract philosophical principle in the context of a uh, cultural issue she thinks is pressing. So she'll both introduce some theoretical uh, uh, points and then apply them. Um, you know, some of what she says about what is a philosophical principle comes up in the context of her talking about Watergate and Richard Nixon. And so um, hmm. Alex is talking about how knowledge is generated and disseminated, but in the context of climate science. And he said, yeah, but more generally, I mean, you could expect the same structure to exist in other areas of research. So I, I think of that as philosophy. I mean, it's much more applied than you might, than is typical for um, university professors. University professors tend not to do things so applied and so um, presently relevant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so that's why, because at the Ayn Rand University, there's the, the, and Ayn Rand had the term, the new intellectual, Mm -hmm. and there's the terms professional intellectual. And so there's a question of like what the different professions could look like, what their focus is, what they're spending their time working on. And, you know, as a, in terms of the path people and young people could take Mm -hmm. now, uh, and I think it might be more open to more different types of careers than it was, you know, even 20, 30 years ago, mm-hmm. where if you were really interested in, you know, if you read Kierkegaard and Hegel and you were like, oh, this is interesting. And which is a pretty unique branch of a human, I mm-hmm. think, or, or, or Locke or Rand or yeah, anybody. Sure. Right. And it's a pretty unique person that is like. I'm going to continue doing this to myself. <laughs> like, it's it's not like, just a phase. It's or, not yeah. just a phase. Like I'm going to continue this. Um, and so, you know, it's like I can see a professor who's going to continue doing that at a university. They're going to have class students in front of them mm-hmm. of other, you know, unique people, but most of them, probably 80% of them will go off into other things, 
hopefully what the professor will convey is a certain in the best in my view the best possible world is a certain different ways of thinking mm -hmm. that I think is what a professor and a philosophy on an undergraduate should really be helping college students with I mean you might disagree but um, that that's what I think of like a philosopher in today's context and then an intellectual is kind of a philosopher applied or someone who's thinking about these issues uh, but they're they don't seem to be as obsessed maybe that's the best word for with the theoretical mm -hmm. pure theoretical where they're really you know in that world of like big arguments way above everyday world like alex is very obsessed with reality and i don't mean that in like other philosophers aren't necessarily but i just mean he's really thinking about how does a an executive at a oil firm think about what's the the arguments going against them the laws that are starting to impinge on their business mm -hmm. and how can i reach them in their language that they use give them some new language to model to help them solve this very the problem x mm -hmm. and he's obviously amazing at it he's brilliant i mean i'm super inspired by alex i don't mean to demean him by saying he's you know not that but there's, there's my point is just obviously a, a, a different not a, yeah, yeah so there's a theorist i mean he, he'll come up with new theories um i think he'll also talk to really smart philosophers and learn learn like learn cip he them, has yeah. said publicly many times that the whole thing is from a conversation with Ankar of philo now mm -hmm. Ankar, i would say is more of a philosopher right he's so that that's what i'm saying like is there a distinction that matters or not or does it um, not really matter I mean, I, I, so there is a distinction between, I think, uh, a philosopher and an intellectual. I think intellectual is just the broader category. So it's okay. So philosopher is one type of intellectual. intellectual. And oh, then there, and then there's, yeah, then there's a, a phenomenon I call public intellectual, okay. which is somebody who's producing intellectual output for, uh, not for other researchers and intellectuals. Wait, wait. Putting so, it out there for, for like people niche who, people in their field. So there is a type of person who produces research that is, who am I writing this journal article for? Well, it's other researchers in my field. Sure. Okay. Um, that makes sense. And yeah. then there are people who uh, might not do that at all, or do a mix of things, and their their audience would be um, broader than that. It doesn't necessarily have to be just like the every man like general audience. You could like if I wrote. Um, a uh, <clears throat> philosophy of science article in my audience wasn't other philosophers of science, but other uh, was um, uh, scientists and science journalists say. Yeah. That's not for other researchers, but it's also not for the general public. So there's, there's a kind of array of um, uh, folks you might sell your intellectual products to. And on the, I guess the one like extreme would be other researchers and on, the other side of that would just be ev everyone, um, kind of general audience uh, product. And then, you know, there's in between and the same person might do a mixture of both or so. That makes sense. Yeah. So one of the reasons I'm asking that is you have, a, I, I saw that you have a course on a boot camp for, is that correct? Course? On, a on ARU, a boot camp for getting into oh. graduate school. <laughs> That that did exist at one point. Um, it oh, okay. was yeah. It's it's gone. Uh, Sorry, folks. Yeah, it's de <laughs> defunct, gone. I guess. Okay. Um, just so, there there were there was not. Uh, yeah, graduate there were, school. Yeah, there were a number of people applying to graduate school. Um, oh, so you put this for them? We to... put this together for them, like what to think about, and like so how to think about whether or not you should go to graduate school, and how to go through the process of applying. Yeah. And um, the reason it ended is just that most of the people uh, who were in the position of needing that advice were also getting it from um, their, their university. Uh, so, okay. So, and there's uh, nothing unique you thought you could provide. Uh, well, I could, if, if you didn't have access to that, any form of that advice. So okay. if you're an undergrad, so when I was an undergraduate applying to master's programs, I, I went to an advisor and they were kind of like, oh, here's this list of schools you might apply to. And that was about all the advice I got. So somebody who's mm. in that position, I could help a lot. But somebody who's in a really good master's program and the master's program has a track record of getting their students into good PhD programs and they really know how to do that. 
think they'll give better advice than me. I see. Um, and okay. we had we had a, it turns out we actually had a a lot of people who were in that situation and not many who were in the situation of get having no guidance. Um, yeah. So it was sort of it, in organizing it. I thought it was the reverse that most of the students were not getting any guidance. Okay. But then you know it, after having a couple weeks of this, we sort of realized that it wasn't exactly needed. So the, so the, most of the people going into ARU at this time or recently are in good master's programs. Um, no, that was, that was a, just a group of people in our extended network. Some of them had I see. finished the previous program we had called the objectives academic center. Um, some of them were in ARU. Some of them were junior fellows. Some of them were just people we knew who we thought were smart and wanted to work with. It, it was a kind of mixture of, of people. It wasn't, this is, this predated ARU. I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Wait, when did you start working at ARI? Uh, September, 2020. Oh, okay. So only three years, two and a half, two years, and a half ago, years. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm interested in the university. I mean, I work at the at ARI, of course, I'm in. And I know a little bit about the university, but it's, and I was an OAC graduate of the four-year program. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm always just curious because it's so new. It's, and, and I, I really am optimistic and hopeful about what it can do in a really dynamic, different, possibly different market for universities and mm -hmm. what people, especially in the, um, in the humanities, right? I, I think the schools that are teaching for science and the hard sciences and engineering, I think those are probably still, I'm sure they'll tweak on the edges, but those are pretty good. I would mm -hmm. imagine. I think the, and I'm sure a lot, I know a lot of people agree with me. The humanities is kind of a disaster in mm -hmm. my, in my view. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I don't know if you agree with that, but. Well, I, I do think there is a value to a humanities degree at the, uh, in, in a mainstream university, but I do you think, consider mainstream? Like uh, Harvard, like a not, prestigious? well, a state school. Oh, you think a state school? Uh, yeah. A state school, a Harvard, just, uh, I guess it doesn't really make like well, university like, of Colorado. A, what's a non mainstream university. I mean, I wouldn't go to like a, a Liberty university or some kind of religious institution okay. like that. Um, so I mean, a, a university that sees itself as giving a, secular education i mean so okay. some catholic universities will qualify for that it's qualify as that like i see um, georgetown or st louis university or, or like that but there like are university of colorado you yeah. think something like i mean but the I the see. value that you get out of those humanities degrees um because i didn't get any value bro what are you talking about well it's, i paid it's off a my loan it's a value non-humanity like i did not yeah. make i paid off with separate well, things that's, but that's not that, that's the value yeah. is that um it gives you <laughs> skills you probably should have picked up from a good high school education by the time you're okay, a sophomore. Okay, so yeah, I've heard that. I yeah. don't like that. That's no, a, yeah, that's not that's good. That's horrible. I'm that's not that's not good, but off. that's if you're if you're if you're 20 and you're um and you're, you know, your public okay. high your public schooling has failed you. Yeah. Where do you go to remedy that? Yeah. Um and uh, that's a, a good point. a, a, that's a, good a point. respectable university if you actually, you know, do your work and think like just enrolling and so, screwing off in College, if you, which just, I think is what you, most people use mo it for, is yeah, what yeah. most people use it for. They, it's your ticket to the middle class, so long as you get a gentleman C and that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> gentleman C, yeah, that's what my dad calls it. <laughs> gentleman like C, that. yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, um, I don't know. Like I went to the University of Colorado Denver. Maybe it's because I went to Denver. I don't know. But I thought I was a liberal arts major, um, and now my degree was actually film theater production, with a minor in philosophy. Mm -hmm. Uh, just because I was so interested in it at the time, I kept taking all the classes like, well, what do I need to do to make this a minor? Not that that mattered. I think that all the stuff you just said, I did not get from them. Yeah. I got on my own and at OAC. And, and I mean that 100%. That's that's probably true. that's probably like, true, but I don't think you're the typical student. So I, I'm, I'm so what's the value to somebody who's uh, is super interested in ideas and um, and is. Uh, above average intelligence and things like that. I'm thinking, what's the value yeah. to the average person, like who comes out of a, a mediocre public school? And um, the value of a humanities degree is that people who have the skill of being able to 
uh, have the basics of the skill of being able to follow a complex argument over the course of, you know, a hundred page plus book and then write your own argument and construct um, logical uh, chains of thought from the you know, construct, constructed grammatical sentence, a logically argued uh, reasoned paragraph into a, that kind of thing you're supposed to get by the time you're, I don't know, a sophomore in high school, I think. I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, I, I don't have experience in the, it's just to put a year on it, but it's the sort of thing that, like, I had an above average high school education, yeah. and I could do that by the time I was in um, college. And then when I had my freshman writing class, I was just completely blown away that here were other people 18 19 years old and they couldn't put together they could barely put together a coherent sentence i couldn't do that till i was like 27 put together a coherent sentence not i don't i mean not consciously not under my control so i i, I oh, read you mean, a you lot didn't, you didn't know the rules of yeah grammar. i didn't know the rules of grammar i, I don't so. i don't mean like that i mean just like write me a paragraph about um uh, you know about what you did but, what you did uh yesterday afternoon but i believe <laughs> that would have been disjointed before 27. Yeah. Because I think part of learning the rules of grammar, if you do it properly, isn't actually learning like what is a gerund and all these things, which are uh, helpful. I, I agree with that. But, but but what I'm saying is if you're a, let's say you're a philosophy major yeah, or an English major, what you'll do is if you actually do the work is you'll read a bunch of um, well-structured pieces of writings that, that make arguments and then you'll have to uh, construct your own, mm -hmm. and you'll get feedback from people who know how to do this. Do they? Yeah, they do. I, did, I they mean, do. maybe I just have, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I remember, I just, I, maybe it's because I just have such a strong bias and hatred of it <laughs> that I just cannot see the good. And then also in listening to you, I, I understand what you're saying with the English so my degree was film production. Yeah. Well, if so you maybe that was you, part if, of it. If you majored in some kind of, you know, BS studies, gender studies, yeah. something like that, I'm sure you wouldn't get this out of what I'm talking about out of that. You'd get it, at, you know, in, you're reading great works of literature or yeah. the history of philosophy or the history of ideas. If you took like political theory or what, whatever they call it now. Um, um, Who knows? I think they make stuff a, up all the yeah, time. Yeah. And then, it, you know, it, then, then like you were saying earlier, the quantitative kind of hard sciences are way better um, than the, yeah. in term, comparatively way better than the humanities. Yeah, I mean, I still have my troubles with it. I'm not sure I 100% agree. Like, like the standard student is really getting that. I mean, uh, I understand can, that it's maybe it available. You, you but... can get it if you um, look for it. I mean, there... But you could do I that think... in high school. Shh. Get it if you look for it by mm. by just reading and doing those things. I, I'm not convinced about that. I mean, I just didn't see the professors. That, like, there was a few professors that were okay. Yeah. Most of them were just not at that caliber. I mean, there was. I had like a good history of Greek a Greek history professor. Um, there was a couple. Maybe the philosophy professor was okay. One of them was okay. I don't know. That that was, where did you go again? University of Colorado Denver. Denver. Okay. Yeah. Um, so not, it was not, I mean, yeah. So your mileage may vary like the, yeah. be, the, the better the university, the better the professors are going to be. So exactly. I, I, so I went to Rutgers university, which has one of the top philosophy departments in the world. Yeah. So, so you're going to get my, a but yeah. if, uh, if I went to, um, a place with a mediocre philosophy department, I still think I would be able to learn certain things from them. Um, mm. if you're, but if you're, you know, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel, <laughs> um, then yeah, then then there is then there is an issue. If, then it's more like uh, open yeah. to chance. Like you might have that really great professor, and then the, the rest are just kind of like dialing it in. They have tenure; they don't care. Uh, but that still just leaves it open to is. So I understand that the value is potentially there, in a lot of places. Like if you really go at it, you you do the extra stuff, and mm -hmm. you know you really think about sure. Um, but that's not how, I don't think that's how it necessarily works, especially if well, that's not how it not, should, it's not how it should, not be. How it should yeah. work, but it also, that's not how, like they're not selling it in that way. That's also true. And so that p kids aren't even thinking of it as that way. Oh, right. Yeah. So, if, so the, if the question is, is there a value, there's that value, but is the, but if the question is like, 
is should that take four years of your life and cost you a quarter million dollars and those other okay, it didn't cost me that those other I, would say I it mean, was the color of Denver yeah na- now it, I don't know I mean but I mean like at the my, place where it costs that hopefully yeah. they I, I'm they're getting something, something other than a just little remedial bit more. skills yeah. yeah yeah I mean I'm hoping yeah. or at least the remedial skills yeah. um I, I I don't know I I've really had a hard time so where I my ba- upbringing and you know middle class mm-hmm. working class folk where academics and professors were a joke like it's, they're losers mm-hmm. in my worldview growing up right there. These are people who like, I have to, my taxes pay their yeah. loser salary or whatever. Mm-hmm. And Oh God, whatever they don't do anything. Um, I mean, that's not like stuff we talked about at the dinner table or anything, but that was the, if you ask somebody right? that would be, what yeah, that'd would be say. like the yeah. general you, idea you know, of like, oh, what, what do you doing? think of English professors? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like, oh, like I didn't, we didn't have like friends who were English professors yeah. or anything. I have grown to respect them more because of objectivism mm-hmm. Reaching them and I opened my eyes to their value and um, it inspired me and yeah. a lot of positive things because of objectivism. I still think that the way universities are today, like I don't think it would be a world shattering event if all of them just collapsed now. Like today, well, if the humanity, PM, if the humanities the, departments the humanities, dissolved, I yeah, I think that would on net be a good thing, but. If the other departments for which there are no replacements for yeah, like, dissolve, the, like, like engineering and yeah, no, that would be that would be a calamity, catastrophic, yeah, catastrophic disaster of all. Now that doesn't mean that the university system is the optimal system under which those things should be done. Yeah. Right? So like, what is a university? Um, it is a medieval institution. Yeah, that's a, like thirteen hundreds, right? Yeah, d- yeah, designed to teach you the. Quadridium and the sacred. No, that's text. the. Is it the? I thought it was the tri- triumvirate. Tri- triumvirate, but there's a there's a four part one. Yeah, I think uh, that came later. Is right? that later? Yeah, I believe because isn't it? It's like math, science, history. It's you know, rhetoric. It was, oh, it's it was rhetoric. Rhetoric, grammar, grammar, yeah, grammar yeah, yeah. Um, theology, Thank and you. theology is theolo- of course theology yeah. and probably geometry something like that. And theology would. I mean, those aren't terrible if you translate them to like philosophy and you know rhetoric and. There's, there's some value to that. Although yeah, I think that could be done I mean, by the they, time you're 16 years yeah, old. Yeah, they also didn't. Well, but that that was more like the age of people who finished yeah. finished those. So, um, but there was, I mean, you know, there wasn't as much known back then. So there couldn't be a whole yeah. slew of departments. Yeah, that's, but, that's true. but the, the so point of the, point. the point is that those, we still have the same, I mean, just like even to the point of the clothes we wear at graduation, It's it's all like... Medieval. medieval decisions that are just carried on and, and copied and like why is there a, a break every summer yeah yeah <laughs> and everybody Especially, just does that and we just yeah, yeah there's a summer break and like if you're a professor that's a lot of fun because you get a you work nine months and then you have summer break like you did when you were a little kid so although you, a lot of the contracts i understand unless you're tenured is you only get paid for those right um is that correct well, I mean, is that so, just is that just like high school and well, uh, well, K through twelve? Uh, actually, I don't know. So I never had one of those positions. I always had per class contracts. But okay, even if you don't, you're salaried. So you you yeah, you don't you just have to save up your money. So if you get yeah, if your university professor professorship pays you ninety k a year plus benefits, okay, maybe you don't get a paycheck in. Um, June, July, and August, but you still get oh, that. Uh, okay. So you just had, yeah, that, that would be how it would work out. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, summer perks, like you can teach a class in the summer. For yeah. yeah. I once, uh, I once lost a graduate student teaching opportunity because a professor wanted a new deck <laughs> and he was supposed to say he wanted to teach in, uh, I think the deadline was like April. Yeah. And like three weeks before the semester started, he's like, I want to teach this class. So, uh, yeah. what a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> they have all the power. Yeah. So yeah, university is a 13th or 14th century invention that we're still in some of its model. There's, there's a kind of romanticism to it that is some of it's good. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'd be curious for you, like what, when you were starting to want to be an academic as a profession, was some of it, associated with the 
you know, romance of a university. Like there's people in coffee shops talking about big ideas uh, and no, not, that, not that, really. the campus life didn't appeal. To you? I mean, campus, campus life is nice because it's a whole bunch of people who have similar interests to you. Like generically, they're all uh, interested in ideas, even if they're not specifically interested in philosophy. So yeah. they tend to be more intellectual, um, more curious, uh, um, more argumentative if you enjoy that kind of like conversation. Um, so that's, it has an, a certain type of appeal to a certain type of person and definitely appealed to me. But the reason I wanted to be a philosophy professor was that was the only place you could be a professional philosopher. Um, so now you, you know, so really I'm talking for you, about, it was like the craft. Well, I'm talking about like, these decisions I made in like 2006 and seven to go into graduate school. So yeah. there was not like, it was not people, uh, blogged, but they didn't make money off of it. It was like still a hobby. That, that wasn't an option. Yeah. yeah it, so it, it wasn't like I, so now somebody now could, I, and I'd be still questioning somebody who would think this. But coming out of undergraduate, I want to be a philosopher. I'll just do podcasts and and um, YouTube and a blog. I I'm skeptical that you can start that way as opposed to transition to that. Still, um, but there are other there Wait, are other. Options. You, do you mean like as a philosopher? As, as a full time job, and I'm gonna. This is how I'm gonna support myself. I'm gonna support myself as a philosopher by making videos or something like that. Got it. Like you don't yeah. think you think that that's still too tenuous to yeah out. and i think the people who have done that and done it well um are either transitioning from so they already had public um notoriety like jordan peterson or or uh, sam harris or they have some kind of um pizzazz they're really good at making certain things entertaining um there's a uh a former graduate student who has a YouTube channel. It's called like counterpoints or something like that. Yeah. She's very entertaining. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're kind you of, you don't think philosophers have to be entertaining at all. I mean, if you like for me, <laughs> like I don't have any like, you know, performer performance, um, um, skill. So it would just have to, Oh, you're interested in this, this philosophy of science topic. And then I can, entertain you based on the content but uh, <laughs> well but I mean, so i mean this person put, does like skits and makes jokes and and but it's all it has content to it so well, there, but so there there's like a, a whole people can do that if you're good if you have that talent yeah. um that but that is how i mean that, get, that i agree with you that's a different skill set yeah there but, are there are very high quality philosophy um blogs and podcasts and youtube videos that don't get a lot of hits because it's just some guy or woman just sitting there. Is, Let me tell you about Plato. And they really, you know, they'll tell you about Plato better than you'll get Plato at, at any university. Um, but it's not particularly. Well, but should that person have ever been a professor if they're so bad that nobody wants to watch them? Well, usually those people are also professors. Oh, okay, that's even worse. Yeah. Because <laughs> that means they're torturing their kids, their poor kids. Like, why couldn't. Like if you're going to, especially if you're going to do something that's so already established. Yeah. I mean, so you need to, so it's you, not need, like a, if you he's, need a performer could, skill in addition, in but addition to But I think that's true skill. of anybody, unless you're going into pure theory and you're really trying to push the edges of something. Like if you're teaching Plato, you should learn how to make Plato interesting. That should be part of your job. Well, it, it depends on what kind of job you have and you want. So um, if you have a research professorship, let's say. Which is the in Plato in yeah in Plato or or any other area of philosophy? What you do is you huh. do research on Plato. You write books and articles about Plato, and then you teach graduate seminars on Plato to people. And who te takes those seminars? They people who already are super into Plato. So, but there's been so much written about him. Like, are you saying that there's so much? New, I mean, new, should so sh but the, should <laughs> there be those professorships? That's or? what I'm asking. Okay. Yeah. Um. Like. If you can't I mean, make it entertaining it's, it's or hard to interpretive answer. to today's it's hard, audience. It's hard to answer that question. Should there be people whose job is to do cutting edge researchers and teach and mentor new researchers? Yes. Cutting. 
So I mean, like that, that's what the, they're doing. You're saying that's the, so the so those they're people, teaching the cutting edge. People. Yeah, those people are the equivalent of a uh, cancer researcher who has a lab where he mentors new cancer researchers. Um, he's not seeing patients and that kind of thing. Like that, that is what um, the equivalent is in philosophy. Mm. Now, does it make sense to have that kind of thing in philosophy? That's a good question. But that's that's those are the, the kind of jobs that people who teach philosophy actually have are. Some yeah. people just teach undergrads and you're right. You, that's part of the job is to like get everybody interested in this and communicate why this is important to learn and, and um, you know, keep it al alive and exciting in their mind. Like that's part of the job. If you're teaching graduate students, people who are getting masters and PhDs in um, philosophy, they come in kind of already believing that hmm. and they're already excited to learn it. Now, maybe if you say, I'm going to teach a class on this obscure figure you students have never heard about, then like, yeah, yeah you'd have to sell that figure. And like, why is this important to learn? Um, is it just like Mike's niche little thing that just he cares about? Or no, it's really valuable for everybody. You have to make that case. But I mean, yeah. like if you're, hmm. if you're teaching, like I, I had a professor who was like that and he was a really good, prof he was a really good mentor teacher of philosophy, um, of epistemology, um, but like how great would he have been as an undergrad, as an undergrad teacher? I don't know, but I don't know about that, but that so just wasn't his job. I had never heard of that or thought yeah. of it that way, but that makes a lot of sense. I still think like it should be very delimited then. Like I, I feel like it's probably bloated and expanded beyond all comprehension. Yeah. How many people, like, how many people like, would that really doesn't need, need that to job? Be that many yeah. people in that position, I feel. And I, I'm not convinced that most people go into it that that's their passion for it. Well, this or is there's just this, some kind of like interest in like, can I make money talking about Play Doh? It's like, well, it, you can, but you, then you, being interesting about it is part of your job. But, but this this goes to um, the question you asked earlier about the university system. Like, the university system is a uh, combination of public dole and charity. Yeah. <laughs> so like it's a good way of putting so it. So it, it like remove yeah. all of the governmental funding and support like and it's not just that they give money to universities, they're state universities. It's the NHS, the National Humanities National Humanities something they fund society? Yeah, they fund they're a government granting institution. There's a national science um 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 the, there's an, the equivalent in the hard sciences where you send grant proposals to them and they give you money, um, all of this stuff. Remove all of that from the world. How many philosophers would there be doing what? I mean, there's no, there's, <laughs> I, not, yeah. there's not an answer to that question. Yeah. But it you would know, probably you, be a lot less. Maybe sure. it'd be a ton more. Really? I, I mean, oh, I have yeah. no idea. Right. There, there's, it, it's like how many, um, uh, you know, how many... Uh, uh, huh. There's allegedly a doctor's shortage. How many doctors should there be? Well, the way you answer that question is look at what the market demands. And if there's yeah. no market, you can't really say how many there should be. And there's not really a market for philosophers. What there are is a... Uh, is well, like education, a, like well, training of the mind. There's an education, but even... Think but you're of, talking about like the research. <laughs> yeah, but, well, yeah. But, but no, but just think, okay, go more broadly. There's public education at the K, K through 12 level too. So what would it look like if there were really a free market of education top to bottom in every respect? Would there be more? Would there be less philosophers? Would there be universities? Would there be more um, something like apprenticeships? Like maybe the best way to learn chemistry is not that there's a department of chemistry. Maybe you get an internship at Dow Chemicals and you're mentored yeah. by somebody. Like who knows? Um, and what would philosophy look like? I've, I've thought for uh, a while that... In that kind of situation, what job would a philosopher of science have? And I think they'd work for something like Bell Labs. They'd um, a philosopher of science. A philosopher of science, yeah, some kind of research uh, institution. They'd teach researchers mm -hmm. the history of their field with a with an epistemological bent. Like this is how, you know, they're not every problem is just a sui generis research problem. There are people who have confronted similar puzzles in the same field in the past, and like here's how they solve them and um, how many people would there need to be like that? Yeah. Uh, again, there's, there's the no answer because the there's so, so much of what 
probably would be done by private corporations in the pursuit of profit is just offloaded onto the universities like it's called basic research or theoretical research yeah where does theoretical research in physics happen not at um google it happens at harvard well yeah and then they do talks at google yeah and- or but and, they publish, and they, you know, and then they, they, Google they, hires them yeah, or something or, to do something. Or what happens is, you know, they like with AI. That's oh I, no, I'm it. thinking something more along the lines of this. Like so, uh, I think it's um, solid state uh, hard drives are based on some quantum physics research done like in the '80s, uh, and uh, one the guy won a Nobel Prize, but like it's obviously worth trillions of dollars. Like that, yeah. That, and how did it come about? Well, I mean, this guy had a university position somewhere. He probably made just under six figures for most of his life. <laughs> and he came up with this insight and he published a paper. And then other people thought, okay, so that, why, would, why would Apple bother paying for any of that when it's done by the universities? Yeah. That makes sense. So like they would have had to put the money into the researching of that yeah. to, to hope to one day get that. I mean, like it, it, I was this... reading the chat GP, GPT person or whatever who put that together. Mm. My, I think it's Microsoft is looking at a billion dollars to put into that. I, no, I don't know. Do you know anything about him or that? Not, that? Okay. not, not in particular. But I but bet it... it's something similar where it's like a, you know, a guy or a couple nerds and school or whatever figuring something out real yeah. genius style and they come up with something cool and now they can so but i see what you're saying like they, I mean, they're being floated by this academic yeah ab- circuit. Ab- abstract theoretical research in the sciences is so obviously materially valuable now yeah. in a way that maybe it w- maybe even 100 years wasn't that the idea that it wouldn't get done if it wasn't done by the universities i think is crazy like that if there were no if nobody was producing, oh, just because research, it's so clear how how it's valuable cl- it's clear it is. the value yeah. line is from yeah. this paper, and it's not like that's not just because um, that has been the argument of universities of like, look, all the stuff that's coming out of us, and you know, in terms of these great innovations, which yeah. is true, but yeah, the that is a clear argument in the opposite. That, that it doesn't that, need to be done by that doesn't university. need to be now, done how, by taxpayer what, what, money. What would it actually look like if if yeah. people were free to do this? I don't know. Maybe it would still be something like a university, and it would be funded by no, I mean, a I, consortium of of uh, of uh, technology companies, or maybe it would be done in house, and they'd keep research confidential. And uh, I mean, there, or, there's or an infinite yeah, ways. There's a, I mean, companies yeah. could come together, pool money yeah, together, right, and say right. like. Okay, we're going to split whatever so, comes out. So of long it. as Who they're knows? paying taxes anyway and it's being yeah. done uh, yeah. on somebody else's dime, yeah. um, why would why yeah. do it why, yourself? Why do it yourself? Yeah. No, I agree. And I, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because it, it could really go in any direction. And I see what you're saying. I mean, I think um, Alex Epstein, one of his first big articles was on Rockefeller mm-hmm. and the history. And he talked about how research and development was invented by Rockefeller, mm-hmm. essentially, because mm-hmm. he wanted to figure out things like, how do I get most out of the most value out of this kerosene? Yeah. And I want to make more money. And so like, I need chemists. And how do we do that? And then that's where all that. And then they came up with revolutionary ways to. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, chemist, chemicals. Bell Labs is a, is a good example of this. Yeah. I mean, um, a lot of the early Apple University. Yeah. Now, yeah they yeah, just yeah. they're expanding in Austin. Oh, are they? I, I actually don't know too much about what exactly they're doing um well they have a campus here yeah but what are they what are they attempting to accomplish with that i think they're well i i don't know if the this campus is like because i know they have a campus in california that was steve jobs vision Mm -hmm. that was about that there was going to be a learning component to it Mm -hmm. for sure heavy learning component yeah Um, but do they see that as a charity thing or do they see that as part of the yeah i didn't look into that yeah. I, I don't think it is charity i don't i don't think it's that um but i could be wrong i don't want to yeah you know I don't, I don't think it's like open to the public either i don't think it's just anybody can walk in and try this it's really for their employees yeah i mean how many employees do they have like eight hundred thousand five hundred thousand something like that like but why do they but uh, my question would be like, why really do they need to do that what's the goal of that so the only thing i remember so i've read steve two of steve jobs bios but it's been years but one of the things I remember is he really wanted to convey um, 
some deeper things about what Apple's trying to do. Okay. And he he wanted like, to teach the employees. He wanted to it. yeah. Okay. He wanted a place where you could really teach employees and get. So it was about really educating them on the Apple way. Okay, that makes sense. And the sense, Apple yeah. way of thinking. And I do think there's also an element of, you know, uh, yeah. the engineering part and and sharing ideas. Now I don't think it was like a Bell Labs necessarily. Maybe there'd be. I, I don't. I it's not like there. It's not like they've said, "Hey, you know what? It would be better if we just hired the brightest fifteen-year-olds and taught them computer science ourselves." Yeah, I don't, maybe I don't know. Yeah. yeah that's, so that that's the that'd kind be a good idea, though, right? Like, maybe. I mean, you know, good. I mean, again, it's the same thing. Uh, like maybe it would be, but right, yeah. if you're fifteen and you've got a job or a, not a job offer, if you got a scholarship to Harvard or I don't know MIT computer science, right? So that's probably better. Place MIT to go. or Caltech or something like. Yeah. Or Apple wants to hire you and train you. Like maybe that's a, that's probably a tough decision. I don't know which is the better choice. Well, we're talking the yeah. fantasy land yeah. of a free market. So yeah, you're yeah. right. In and this maybe market, MIT doesn't exist in a free market. Instead, yeah. that's all internal to to you know Boston Dynamics and all that, yeah all those kind of places. those guys are doing some crazy stuff. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we talked about what is a university. So you have your own views about how you think it might operate. What about Oh, you do or you don't? I, I mean, I have <laughs> I have some speculation on what it would look like if if you know if we had a a, a free market in higher education. I think ba- basically what would happen. Well, that's is what the Iron University is, kind of. Um, yeah, but it's st- it, it still exists in a world that it's like it's like private schools competing with public schools. Like yeah. as good as they are, they're still yeah. But I already pay for the other one, and it's so. Now I have to pay twice for this. So it's got to be like really exceptional. But if I had to do it over again, I would not do college, I don't think. You don't think so? Not for me. Yeah. I do think there's a market, but I do think I gained immensely from it. Yeah. Um, I I would, if I were not pursuing. So I think for you, you need to do the university route. And I think that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, there like are if certain, you wanted... certain careers that you have, like you cannot, you cannot practice law without a law degree. So if you want to be a lawyer, you have to go to law school. Yeah. Which means you need, you have to go to undergraduate. So, so there's certain, so, but yeah, if you're not, and it's same thing with philosophy, you need a, uh, to teach it, you need a, at least a master's, even if you want to teach it at a community college. So certain professions, if you want to go into, you either have to, by the nature of the profession, or almost certainly do just based on what options are available yeah. or possible. There's other things. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the, uh, I have a, I have a friend who's an objectivist who's in, uh, uh, he's a software engineer done exceptionally well for himself. He's self-taught. He dropped out of college. Um, so was that the good choice for him? Probably. That was probably uh, the right choice. Like if you want to do that, do you need a four-year degree to be a software engineer? Or can you do some combination oh, of, okay, yeah, some okay, combination okay. of so, like a, one of these coding schools plus your own practice and get a job where you have people who can mentor you and teach you more? Is that a better career path? And it's yeah. pl- very plausible to me that that is. I, th- I mean, look, I think the majority of kids who go to college do not need to go to college. And all, and I mean, I mean, outside, outside of engineers and yeah. but I'm saying like in the humanities, which I think is the majority of people, right. Who go get a four year degree. I don't think the majority are getting high level science and electrical engineering degrees. Yeah. I'm not I don't sure. know the numbers, yeah, but I don't I, know the numbers either. Yeah. But I mean like, so if we just take that out and just talk about the humanities, yeah, I just, I, I mean, I don't. I just don't think that most of us do. I mean, obviously, it's, the, the not, value I, of the humanities I, is something that could be offered by a non-university that's what for I'm a saying. fraction yeah. of the cost. Yeah, and that's yeah. that's my my main point, which is what I'm excited about with the Ayn Rand University as a potential for the future. I think now, so. Now the issue is, like you're saying, making the argument to people who have the view that the way to the to a better life is going to some university. Mm-hmm which is what the universities are banking on, mm-hmm. right? It's like, look at this shiny thing. You come here and we will de- you'll definitely have a better life. And parents are still, you know, 
no matter what they might say politically, they're still like when they're kids. Yeah. Like, is this are, is this preparing my kid for SAT so they can get a, like they they they'll they'll chant like down I hate universities but then their kids yeah gotta get hey buddy you gotta study so you get a good skull no there there's there's, there's still there's that view there's movements away from that I'm I'm uh was it uh uh one of the major accounting firms is no longer requiring oh I did de- yeah degrees they just want yeah. you to take some kind of knowledge test um and uh, there are other things happening like that that I've read about happening like that that are you know, yeah. If that if that maintains and gets larger, then then you know, it'll take a generation. But then eventually there'll be parents who are like, yeah, I, I don't think I needed to go to college, and I did, and it was a waste of money. There'll be more people like that. And then you'll well, our generation like, could do that. Yeah, maybe, maybe we're kids. the maybe we're the first ones. Yeah. I, I mean, I I, yeah. I I'm I highly doubt that somebody whose degree did nothing for them in their life is going to then pressure their kid. Yeah. To do the same stupid well, thing. Well, the pressure though would come from society at uh, large. Like, well, sure, but but also just every job requires a bachelor's. Like, the it, a, a, every um, non manual labor job it, or most non manual labor jobs want you to have some kind of, you know, even manual. But the, the, you need a GED. So ha, at yeah. some point, having a bat. There was a period of time. That just what jobs don't require a bachelor's, like the jobs you don't want. <laughs> this was the attitude a lot of people had. Yeah. Like, and it's the, it, even to be, you know, something like. Well, that's um, why I ended up finishing. A secretarial nice work school. or, yeah. or managing. Like I had a, I had a boss when I worked in a, uh, auto parts warehouse and my boss, uh, had a sociology degree. He's like, yeah, I don't do this. It's a garbage degree, but every job I play, you know, I needed that degree to get this job. And what do I do now? I manage the employees in the warehouse. Yeah. <laughs> like, should you need a degree for that? Well, you should, you need a certain level of knowledge and like, um, ability to be organized and do work and show up on time, like all those kind of skills. And so you need well, some that's, skills and the yeah. BA winds up being a proxy for those skills. Yeah. But as soon as there's other reliable proxies, then you don't need that anymore. And fewer and fewer places a requirement, and that's how it'll erode. Um, yeah, I think it'll erode by that, and then, I mean, I think it already is eroding by that. Yeah, I think, I think we're like, seeing the beginnings of the, you know, yeah, the if, cliff falling apart or whatever. Whatever. The cliff falling. <laughs> the, apart. Emo- yeah. the erosion <laughs> metaphor is. It's yeah. it's there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I I that's why I think like by the time our kids are adults, we wouldn't do that to them. People, I mean, people of our age who have kids, both well, but of you us know being I mean. childish. As childless. millennials, yeah, yeah. we're the same age, I think 37, 38, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I just think there's, 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 that's already happening. Ayn Rand University is a real big potential for making the argument for, you know, like if we, and, and I, I think ARI and, and, or ARU, and when I did OAC, was way more rigorous and like doing this and accomplishing this. Like I'm way more proud of like the B that I got at a, a-, a- OAC than like an A that I got in some crap, <laughs> yeah. you know, history of um, right, right. theater class in, um, you know, in, in normal university. So I just I think that 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 what we offer is way more indicative of that. Mm-hmm. It's just an issue of making the argument to the wider public and getting it out there. And by the way, there are students who are actually doing the course courses at ARU who aren't in college. Like this Mm -hmm. is their college right now. And it's a good, you know, it's a good thing for students to, who don't know what they want to do and don't want to get into an expensive degree. They could like try it out and see if they like it for a year or two. I think that's, that's a good way to think about it. You know, um, a lot of people uh, do gap years between high school and college where they try to figure, figure it out. Um, the problem with that is, uh, you can't figure out whether you want to go to college without having at least some knowledge of what it's like to be in college. And something like ARU gives you like, kind of like a hint of that. Like, so you take one class and you do assignments, you write papers, you read things, you kind of have a seminar style discussion. Um, you're, it's more the students being a student is a little more autonomous. You have more, nobody's like you didn't do your homework, you know, detention, like on your, <laughs> on your case, it's like, you didn't do your yeah. homework. And it's yeah. like, somebody might send you a reminder if you haven't done a few homeworks 
are you still participating in the class? Like that kind yeah. of thing. But I'm not going to, I'm not your mommy. I'm not going to come chase you to do your homework. And that's what it's like in college. I mean, in college, n- n- the professors, but n- nobody cares if you're, if, if you check out, you know, that's, you're just, you're an adult now you've checked out. And, um, it's good to see what it's like to be a student in that kind of environment, I think. Yeah. Because I saw, and I'd see this in freshmen, like, when I taught university class, like regular university classes is there is a certain kind of person who now that nobody was breathing down their necks and like in high school, you're like literally in the building all day, all the time. And you have one class after one class after one class. Now you have five classes a week and you have all this downtime. And there's a certain type of person who mm, now that they have all this uh, freedom to plan their own day and everything nothing gets done and they have a yeah and that's that's could just be like yeah i really it turns out i really don't like this kind of academic type work the reason i did it in the past was because kind of i was forced to yeah now that i have the ability not to do it i'd rather not do do other things and hopefully those other things are productive for more more often than not in colleges they're unproductive they're just where do you get all the social stuff though? That's yeah. the only downside. Yeah, yeah. So like there's, that's one of the pleasantries of a university is the getting your, you know, getting a serious girlfriend, mm-hmm. breaking up with your serious girlfriend yeah. or getting broken up with and yeah, all the, that's, you know, that's and, true. And just friendships that last forever. So yeah. that, you know, that, that part, that piece is that's a, that challenging is some to value, place. Value and to there is college. value. Yeah, yeah. There's value the, the, to that the downside to all that is college life is still, even though you have much more autonomy, it's still, it's a a fantasy camp in a different way. Fantasy camp. Yeah. It's why is it fantasy camp? Well, you're, I mean, I, I, the humanities, I would agree. For for, (laughs) some people like it's not because they have a job and they pay for everything themselves. That's but, me. That's but for a lot for of most, a man. lot of people, like who life. pays rent and for food, and it's still mom and dad. So yeah, what do you do with all your time? Well, you kind of take they kind of take their classes, they sleep all day, they play video games, they go to parties, um, and I mean you can even live that way and be a good student. Like, what do you do in your spare time not being a student? Oh, I get drunk on the weekends, and like that's yeah what people do. The, the thing that's good about college, I think, for a lot of people, and especially, you know, a lot of smart people, and I was, I was like this, go to college, and all of a sudden, it's, it, this is especially true if you have a small high school. I graduated with 160. 500 in mine. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> but Rutgers was 40,000 people. So, oh, like, yeah, there's so many different kind of people that yeah. if you were kind of a loner yeah. in, in high school... Or if you kind of didn't have any deep friendships in high school, and then you go to some place that has forty thousand students, yeah. like there's going to be another hundred ver- hundred people that are just like you, and like now you can have a friend. And oh, and there's you know, it's not the same seventy five girls I've known since I was in kindergarten. It's <laughs> it's all these different yeah, people, and you that's kind a big of deal. and that's that. Is, but yeah. you can get that by moving to a city. Like you don't have to go to college. You can just, oh, yeah, I'll, but they're not all in a similar there's, there's geographic so, area they're not all there's she's not sitting right next to you yeah i mean she doesn't if, like you know like if you if you if you move to you know i mean i think new to, things would pop up yeah if you move to brooklyn or austin or something and you're you're 20 and can't meet people like you need to learn how to meet people you need to learn how to meet people it's yeah. and, and if you're too or you need to to talk to get some kind of mentor or a therapist or something like there's only so much just putting you in an environment can do to help you like it, for some people it's just yeah like that's the thing and then like that was like for me like you just go to college and it's, oh it's not so bad being more social and then you just become more social but for other people it's no i'm still afraid of my own shadow like i was in high school and that's that's not gonna get fixed no matter where you put them that you need somebody to help you um yeah, to me, that, though, is going to be the harder thing to knock down in people's minds. Because so many people I talk to, especially successful people, and, you know, outside of objectivism, just mm-hmm. friends of mine, you know, they really valued the networks they built in college. And they really see that as a fundamental aspect of their success. Yeah. 
Um, like, you know, oh yeah, my old college friend got me my second best job that now let sure. me, you know, I met, like, I met my wife in, oh, that, in, in, in that, this club in junior yeah, year or something. You yeah. know, and like sororities and fraternities, okay, of yeah. course, are a big part of that. And that's the one that's going to be, I think for them harder, you know, for the, the people that are our age having kids mm -hmm. will be harder for them because they will see it as like the emotion of going there and that's yeah. really we start it's like an experience yeah. it's a rite of yeah. passage something it's like rite that. of passage yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It just as soon as as soon as other things pop up to kind of replace that replace that and hopefully well, in a tinder healthy, has ho failed hopefully in a healthier way <laughs> i know more than a few people who have successful long-term relationships based on tinder dates so yeah yeah i guess i was reading an article about how it's um you know like 10 years of something like new york times said like 10 years of swiping right has led to Loneliness, depression, and you know, extra suicide or something like that. Yeah, it's very morose. I, I, I've I've read an article that's like what online dating does is, um, people match up really late and then, or really really late. People match up very quickly and then what's left are people who need more help dating and yeah, than, no, the, than I, just that's swiping. Clearly true. The yeah. top tier people get more than they normally would, and the bottom tier get less or and it's monotony. yeah it's bad it's, in a certain sense it's bad for that it's good for some people and it's bad for others yeah, so yeah if it's bad for you maybe it's really bad because it just kind of like rubs it in that you have difficulties <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, uh, yeah yeah but um but yeah so i think that'd be a difficult difficult sell on the university so okay that's the university i you know it's an interesting topic about for me in terms of because we both work at a new university yeah. or a potential growth one and there's some good a new alternative a new alternative is a good way of putting it char i'm like leave my dog <laughs> my sorry is my dogs interrupting that's why i lock you in a bedroom so i want to talk about you though before i let you go uh so we talked about this university so you're interested in logic that's yes. your, is that your s specialty uh i wouldn't say it's my specialty it's just one area sure. of interest i have i'm interested in i guess most Broadly, I'd say the foundations of knowledge and in terms of more narrow interests that's manifested as um, philosophy, science, uh, what is okay. uh, what is causation, what's a law of nature, if there is such a thing, um, what's the basic justification for the experimental method, for the use of mathematics and physics. Um, and then uh, related to that is logic and the nature of rational thought um so now you're you're teaching a science his what kind of science philosophy course at ARU? well so in last spring i taught a course in the history of philosophy of science currently i'm teaching a class that's um introduction it's an introduction to uh philosophical thinking okay yeah those so, are very different so there's, there, yeah, those are different. They're not unrelated, but um, this one, the one I'm teaching currently is much more um, a 101 class. Yeah. Whereas the one I taught in the spring was much more like a advanced undergraduate class. Now, when you say like history of philosophy of science, so these yeah. are the thinkers that have shaped the philosophy of science, the philosophy of science. Well, correct? yeah. So what I taught was a course on um, two philosophers who had a uh, strong influence on Charles Darwin. Oh, okay. Specifically on how specifically. he did his thinking and research. So um, a guy named Erasmus? Um, uh, William, Her uh, sorry, John Herschel and William Hewell. Oh, never mind. Yeah. So they're um, both, <laughs> both not well known to the public. Um, if you've heard of John Stuart Mill, who's much more of a, yeah. a people who are much more aware of him. Um, in his lifetime, he had some pretty heated, uh, famous uh, debates uh, with, with William Herschel on the nature of science. And um, Mill went on to become the person people remembered. And Huell was sort of forgotten for about 100 years. And then um, now is kind of going through something of a renaissance and interest in him um, because he said he's a, it's rightly so I think he's a really interesting um, 19th century person and the fact that his work had such a influence on 
um, I mean, he coined the term science, um, and he really? was instrumental in organizing uh, and standardizing a lot of the research practices, um, use of statistics in science, the scientific society, scientific journals. Um, he Science is the term I remember off the top of my head, but there's a whole list of like regular English words now that he, he made up hmm. um, in the courses. So he's had a large impact on uh, the history of science over the last 150 years or so, but not in the sense of like, I'm a Hewellian, somebody would say, and I'm yeah. carrying the Hewellian tor tor torch, whereas there are people now who are, even though they might not call themselves Millsy Mil Millsians, they are, they're utilitarians and yeah. um, empiricists in, in, in thinking about science. Um, so he was... So the, what you just told me was about the terms he created, but what kind of impact specifically? Well, so he on he, on, on Darwin or on science science outside of Dar Well, um, so besides he, coining the term, besides coining the term, so he, uh, I would say two things. So one is he professionalizes. He he's part of the push to professionalize science. So for a period of time, mm. science was like a hobby that gentlemen did natural philosophers yeah natural philosophers you were you know if you were born into money and you were so inclined um in terms of your you experiment e and interest and your intelligence yeah. you would do experiments and you would pay to go on voyages around the world and there were you know there was the royal society where you would send um research and paper and papers and they would publish that but um there was a kind like of they might send a guy like that to america well, so in so in the early days, so to um, gather samples. Have you ever seen the movie uh, Master and Commander? Oh yeah, it's a great movie. Long time ago. Yeah, but was it? Remember the character who's kind of just on the ship yeah, doing yeah, that? Yeah. Like oh, that yeah. was a that was a thing people did. They yeah, no, all go, the time. Yeah, they yeah. would go on, uh, you know, all kind of you know, military ships and commercial ships, and they would just go around and to the world and collect different samples of, you know, here, get this bird, put it in a cage, and make a drawing of some beetle, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that's how they categorize things around the world. Um, but, the, you know, to kind of make this more organized and rigorous, there's journals now and there's... Um, um, and that's what Huell did or helped to what do. What helped to do. Start, um, he started the so process. So he, he, was, he was... Now, what did, but didn't Newton have some... Because wasn't he part of like the... Yes, yeah, so there he was the head of the. There was a royal. The royal, royal society, society is much older than Huell, but because um, my understanding I, I mean, was what he I mean, what Newton I, like put some really important terms and in, into place. Is that correct? Well, what I mean by professionalizing science, okay. I mean making science look like it does today, as opposed to the okay. way science. You, you, a lot of it was you would write letters to other scientists. Is how I got is it. Is how there were you wouldn't write a paper. You would write a letter to to your uh just you know, like look at this colleague. cool bug look, that i found or look at this proof i have of you know look yeah. at, and then then somebody would say oh this is why there's these debates over who discovered what first and it's referring to letters oh so, i didn't realize that yeah that makes sense yeah so so more like you're publishing like, findings my letter was and, lost right. i was the one who invented that yeah and found um, that out. i mean i think so the newton leibniz controversy over who came up with calculus first was settled by people by newton's letters i think oh, okay um and it was not certain about that, but I think that's right. And so, who was it? It was Newton. It was he did yeah. so. Oh, yeah. okay. I mean, it was independent discoveries, but oh, okay. Newton Newton was first, I think. Or I I know Newton was first. I'm pretty confident that Leibniz discovered it independently. Oh, got it. Um, but no, I just in terms of um the journals with standards of publications and things like that is is uh there was a push for this kind of reform in in Victorian science and and Huell was a uh, major um, person in that. And that's not actually what we talked about in the class, though. Um, I mean, no, that's yeah. that's more like sociology of science, which is interesting and important and could be its okay. class. What so what I think is most important about Huell is that Huell and Herschel and um, a few other people were uh, reformers in not just the social organization of science, but in um, the epistemology of science. So they were arguing that. Um, Science properly understood is inductive along the lines of uh, Francis Bacon's uh, philosophy, which Francis Bacon was an earlier uh, um, English philosopher who uh, advocated for the use of experiments in science and for um, 
ga- like massive gathering of data and general generalizing uh, uh, from it. Um, the kind of modern conception of science as um, data gathering and generalizing uh, inductively. And <clears throat> these people, Hewell and Herschel and s- some others, Charles Babbage, um, thought that English science was stagnating because it had abandoned this approach. Um, and they were arguing for a revival of the inductive Baconian approach hmm. um, in science. And uh, Hewell um, wrote extensively and systematically on uh, how to properly do scientific induction. He gave them the guidance when they needed it. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's a there's a uh, there's a question of exactly how did Hewell influence uh, Darwin? I mean, Hewell was the headmaster at at, uh, at Cambridge when um, when Darwin was a student there. Uh, Darwin read or probably read Hewell's multi volume history of the inductive sciences. Um, Darwin used some kind of phrasing and phraseology that seems to originate in um, some other books Hewell wrote. Uh, unfortunately, there's no like smoking gun note like I read Hewell doing blah, blah, blah. Um, so there's a kind of like a, li- a little bit of um, detective work. You have to philosophical detective work. Like Just Hew- Hewell that. advocates doing science this way. And it really looks like Darwin's doing just that here. Yeah. Um, and Darwin's saying that that's the right way to do science. And now, um, is it possible that Darwin just figured that out? Yeah, Darwin's also a genius. So yeah, it's like, he just it's like possible this that, is just the way it should that, be. Right? Yeah, it's yeah, the yeah best it was way. just obvious. That, I, obvious I think, to him. I mean, I mean <laughs> given g- g- yeah, given given how prominent Hewell was at the time, and we know that okay. Darwin admired Hewell and Hewell's work, we just don't like. Well, and probably I would imagine is this true, Hewell wrote it down more systematic. Like yeah, he, if someone's trying to solve a problem, they may say, oh, I just need to do this. And they may not go into it in depth, but Hewell would probably say, okay, yeah, you need to do this in this situation. And here's why in a lot more depth. Is yeah. So correct? Hewell advocates organizing your um, explanations in a specific way. He calls um, consilience um, that, uh, and that's probably what he's most remembered for this idea that there are uh, a good theory will explain a variety of ab- absent this explanation, things that are different and disconnected and you wouldn't think are connected to begin with. So different. New, so think of this way. What, what reason would you have to think that falling apples, the tides, the motion of the moon and the motion of Mars have any connection to each other other than that they're just motions. Um, and you wouldn't really absent some kind of Newtonian understanding. I mean, I, yeah, because I know of, Yeah, you know Newton, right. Yeah. But no, Newton said, these are, these are all effects of gravity. Like the, So, okay, the apple goes up and down, right, towards the earth. Well, that's gravity. But the moon goes around and around in a circle. It's not falling, right? Yeah. And the tides aren't falling. They're going in and they're going out. And they're going, well, it turns out that in a certain sense, yeah, they actually are falling. And the tides are falling towards the moon and then away from the moon and then a little bit towards the sun and then away from the sun. And, um, and uh, the moon is falling constantly towards the center of the earth and it's just fa- moving so fast that it never actually changes its distance from the center. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's advocating that this is a, uh, you know, reaching these kind of, um, uh, uh, this kind of explanatory unit, unity is a, a hallmark of good inductive uh, theory formation. And that's what Hewell and is coming up with. That's that's what Hewell is advocating as advocating. an epistemologist. Okay. And then, lo and behold, Darwin's reasoning um, takes just this structure. Um, now, okay. if Hewell is right, and that's the right way to reason about science, then you could imagine that some brilliant scientist would reason that way without having read Hewell. Yeah. <laughs> so there is yeah. a there is a question: um, how much is Hewell? How much is Darwin? Just being Darwin. Um, now, so Newton was not operating. Well, these... Newton did that too, but he okay. he wouldn't. Uh, I don't think he he would necessarily say that's what he's doing explicitly. Like he's just doing that. Um, and it's, any any scientist in in so far as they're actually succeeding in explaining the world is doing that. And the question is, can you? But he's um, making it explicit. Yeah. Can you can you articulate the steps? that you have to follow to do this successfully? Yeah. Are you self-conscious that you're doing it? 
I mean, anytime you're doing, you can become self-conscious of something you're already doing. You can then do that thing even better. Um, yeah. So Cause you just reapply it yeah, over and over again. Like, yeah. Like why did this work? But this isn't working over here. And it's like, it's like, um, you know, there's a, well, kind of, all of philosophy is like this, right? So we're all already doing in a certain way. We already all know everything there is to know about epistemology. Like we're all, we know things and we know it somehow we're doing yeah. something. And the question oh, is, is, what exactly uh, are we yeah. doing? Uh, and you have to reflect. And then as soon as you can, some more, the more you can articulate what it is that you're doing, what, what it is that's right about what you're already doing, then you can do that same thing over again, better. Like, um, the concept formation. Yeah, like we, we all form concepts somehow. Like little kids know, <laughs> yeah, how to yeah, or little kids know how to speak articulately in English. They don't know any rules of grammar. Yeah, and they hear Yoda talk and they know it's funny and they know it's not right, but they couldn't explain why. But then, uh-huh. you know, at some at some point, you you learn um, a little bit of grammar in in grade school, and, um, and then your writing and communication can become better and more clear. You become a better speaker. Um, you know, you, now I'm, I know grammar. I, I use Grammarly. And, and lo and behold, like there's some new rule. It'll tell me you violated this rule in here. And I yeah. ch- change it according to the rule. And now it's better, of course. Yeah. It's more clear. It's more articulate, concise, whatever. Because of this. So there's still things that you can yeah. learn. And it, but I already knew how to speak grammatically. Yeah. Yeah. <clears> and I mean, that's, that's, that's what, true of yeah, that's, science and making your scientific yeah, you experiments you, even more efficient, so you're not wasting so much time. Right, right. Well, so did you know? So I've I've been dying to tell someone this, and I know you probably know this, but it's like I know nothing about science. I've read a lot of science fiction, especially nineteenth century, and I've read mm-hmm. a little bit about like Jules Verne. You mean? Oh, well, that's late. That's actually. oh, that's late. So like, yeah, that's later, but even earlier than that, like E.T.A. Hoffman. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, Poe, Hawthorne, people like that. Like they, this, wrote, they wrote something that's yeah, they, science like fiction. Yeah, like Rapcini's Daughter. Um, li- oh. They wrote about, like, s- what science is. The You know, they were concerned about things in a little bit different of a light. They were concerned about, you know, I mean, like, uh, Mary Sh- Mary Shelley. And, like, that Frankenstein is a science fiction. Science fiction, sure. Because you consider er, the first science fiction, right, mm-hmm. in certain regard. But... Um, but there are there are some others um, actually, you know. I think you could see it, like depending on how you define it, like Gulliver's Travels have some mm-hmm. of this where they have scientists in it. There's even some work by Cyrano de Bergerac, the real guy, that sometimes where he's like actually, although it's very imaginative, but like people say like, you know, dep- again, this depends how you define science fiction. But mm-hmm. anyway, the point is like if you look at the rhetoric, um, you know, I was researching a little and studying that, and I found out that Newton spent like 30 years of his life investigating the philosopher's stone. Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah. He, 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 and, and part of that is like, if he might've had this formalized process, I wonder if you, cause so I, I, there was actually a a really interesting video that I cannot find anywhere. I was looking for it all Mm -hmm. last night. And it was this really, is a guy who was a history of philosophy of science person or, or maybe just a history of science professor it was a perimeter something. Oh, perimeter institute. Yeah, yeah, perimeter institute, and he actually replicated what was done on a royal stage mm-hmm. regularly of turning co- uh, iron into gold, mm-hmm. and it was just a, a trick basically, and it's something that Newton saw and or heard, and became obsessed with it mm-hmm. because. But so the argument that this professor on the stage today was saying, or ten years ago was that it was very legitimate for Newton to go down this road at his, you know, given the context. Given what, he, what was known Yeah, so like time, when we yeah. hear it, it's like, that's freaking nuts. Like, yeah. why was he? But again, there's like real evidence. There's real, the best thinkers of the time are thinking yeah. this. And so it took him 30 years to disprove that process. Um, but I just found that fascinating. Like, that's the kind of thing that a good process will not necessarily just eradicate uh-huh. that you have to go through the process but if he had a systematic process that would like well check this off check okay now this isn't a real thing yeah I, I don't know a whole lot about alchemy but from from what I do know I think one of the problems so one is it, it it has goals that are not purely just I want to know the truth 
It's like, I want to turn lead into gold, right? So yeah. one of the things that went on with the alchemists was that you kind of want to keep that a little secret so they wouldn't hmm. share results the way... Uh, like, if you're a chemist who just wants to understand um, uh, why, uh, what exactly is going on in, when something burns, yeah, you're just interested in what that is, um, the gold is bragging rights, basically. Yeah. It's just, I figured it out. Look, and I'm going to show you and share <laughs> it with everybody, and I can get credit. Like, or, I mean, it could just be you just want to figure it out. Now I've thought of it, figured it out. I'll keep it to myself just because I don't care if you Well, know there's also not. theories that yeah. like, you might find the Philosopher's Stone of like immortality. Or something like that. Yeah, so like, there's, there's all there's all kind like, of things like the the <laughs> like you'll the really be able to touch God in a sense. Yeah, which the, is what the goal like, of alchemy, alchemy wasn't the, just the like source. to understand chemical change. It was to to make. They these, didn't know it of that yeah, in that yeah. way. Yeah, right, they knew right. it as like there was some kind of source material out in the world that they could find that could touch creation. But it or it, tur like it that. turns out that they that these people actually discovered a lot of. Um, important truths in chemistry, one of the issues is that since there was this element of secret keeping, mm. different people would have different terminologies and mean different things by the same words. Yeah. Um, and so there was a, a real problem of transmitting knowledge from person to person, generation to generation, yeah. which is, goes to the sociology of science kind of thing. Like that's very interesting, one, one yeah. of the things that's important for scientific progress um, is it, we're well past the point in which any one mind can know everything in a field. Yeah. Um, so it's really no more important. Aristotle's. No more Aristotle. <laughs> I mean, yeah. no, n probably no more Newton's either. Um, yeah. Because just to do an experiment, you know, if you look at these journal articles about the uh, um, 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 Large Hadron Collider, like there's hundreds of authors on the paper just mm. because to do the experiment requires you know, somebody has a whole PhD in like calibrating a certain sensor. And that's, if that yeah, sensor is not bad. like doing yeah. what it's supposed to be doing, then the whole experiment is junk. So, um, so there's this, this kind of issue of, of sociology of science. And one of the things that was learned pretty early in figuring out these kind of sociological questions about knowledge is you need is like public standards are really important. Mm -hmm. Like, this is what this word means and this is how we're, and like, then you have debates over how to define, um, combustion or how to define, um, um, oxygen or whatever, but it's, we're sure we're all talking about the same thing. And yeah. it's a, like major breakthroughs still happen when people realize, no, you were talking about this and we were talking about that and they're related, but they're different. And, oh, what's the difference? And then we can articulate that. These are two different substances. We thought they were the same. That's important. Um, standards of measurement too, and units, like all that stuff is, somebody had to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. That this is, the meter is this thing, and there's literally a physical object that's a meter long, or there's a literal, um, I think it's the uh, most spherical man-made sphere is is the kilogram um, object, which is the standard yeah. for all measurements oh, okay. of kilogram. And that's really because you need to, especially when you're doing um, exper experiments that need to be super, super, super precise. I mean, for like measurements, need, you can't just say the king's foot is yeah. the foot. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's not accurate. The I royal mean, you foot. Can, you can if if your margin of error <laughs> is you know like really big. Yeah. Um, uh, and everybody has a print of the king's foot or something, yeah. but yeah, beyond a certain point, it needs to be, and that's that's why now you know they want to understand, uh, they want to define lengths in terms of um, how far light travels in a specific amount of time or things like that. Yeah, precision like, is yeah, precision is important. So important. Public precision, um, like that, we can all share the same precision is is really important for the transmission of knowledge. Yeah, and I wonder. I almost. You know, I think that part of why Newton spent so much time on it, besides the process wasn't there, was it's. I did. I don't know. He might have mentioned this, but that he had to basically recreate all experiments to some degree, right? Because because right. the guy goes through a lot of different things that Newton in his notes is a, that we know that he did this kind of experiment. He was looking for this kind of, you know, geological proof or whatever, and so he had to do mm -hmm. these things and um, so it, things that other you know, I don't know if I know that, but other alchemists might have been trying. Yeah. And he just had to do it again because 
they didn't share anything. So yeah, it, you're basically it, just repeating the same thing that it's like, you know, if he would have gone to the right little village monk or whatever, he would have figured out, yeah. oh yeah, my grandfather did that exact yeah. thing a hundred years ago. Yeah, it's like, that's what? that's <laughs> why, that's why, um, research journals are important. So, yeah. um, it, it and t- Google's important. Yeah, and too. Google's like, important. I mean, like, yeah, we're now we're at a whole other level. Of, yeah, yeah, and then Chat GPT. Yeah, chat G- I just <laughs> just ask it a question. I mean, it, it, a good scientist maybe can evaluate a paper in an afternoon, but if you had to do the whole experiment that you're evaluating in that paper on your own, yeah. take years. So it's a major, you know, major um, part of progress is just how easy it is to share results. So c- can I? I'm going to skip to something that you, based on just what you just said. That worries me about the studies show phenomenon, mm-hmm. right? Like <laughs> studies show this, studies show that. I mean, I would really hope that the serious yeah. scientists out there know to like just what to look for right away so they're not wasting their time yeah. on all this. Because according to all the studies show, one, everything I've ever eaten, drink, and drunk, or, or Studies have shown will kill you. Will kill me, yeah. and it's or something along those lines, or will or will give me superhuman strength and like I'll last forever. Apparently, drinking a glass or two of wine will be great for yeah, me. But, right, right. But another, you know, ounce and I'll be an alcoholic. Like I don't know. Yeah. So, um, so I mean, I don't want to sound like there's not. I don't want to come across as there's no problem with the way certain areas of research are conducted or peer review or things. But that kind of thing is almost always incompetent journalists and university PR departments. Ah. The s- studies do not. So scientists show, do know. Stu- studies will show okay. that, you know, the study will say, like, we looked at a certain number of people who ate eggs every Wednesday. And, like, there was a very, very, very small, but they'll say st- sig- uh, statistically significant, which doesn't mean it matters. It just means it registers as a possible effect in, in some kind of way of measuring. Uh, so, mm-hmm. though, okay, so if you eat eggs on Wednesday, we've measured some chance that there's an, there's a small effect that that might increase your, you know, I said, I uh, just super qualified that because when they actually have those studies, they'll be super, they usually super qualify them th- themselves that there might be some unknown mechanism relating when you eat an egg to your cholesterol level. If you, you know, I just was reading something this morning about. <laughs> You're stuck on this eating, egg. eating, eating, yeah. uh, eating large breakfasts and then tapering off your consumption of food during the day is supposed to be better for you. Yeah, which is the opposite of what I've always been told, or what I've been told the, recently. Yeah, which is always like just feast at the end of the day. Right. So and I'm I, like, but how do I do that <laughs> when I when I'm lifting 500 pounds, you jerk? <laughs> yeah. Like I'm lifting weights, I can't yeah. do that. Yeah. 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 And people give such cr- anyway. But, I'm gonna go off on but this. The, but there's tangent. the actual research. I mean, it's so it's the same sort of it's the same phenomenon that Alex Epstein talks about with um, what the actual research in climatology says, and then what the public actually gets like from yeah. from the New York Times or or, or whatever. And um, there's the same there's that that phenomenon all ac- phenomenon all across science and science journalism which is just that there are certain a combination of bad incentives and um, ignorance and kind of willful posturing on the part of certain kind of journalist activist type people that a the possibility of a small effect relating mm-hmm. eggs to cholesterol turns into eggs give you you know tar in your veins uh, at the at the you know at the time God. the average person kind of gets it from the six o'clock news yeah and then do when you think about can, do, <laughs> do they do, really do this do eggs give you tar in your veins find out tonight at 11 like like that kind but of see stuff. arnold schwarzenegger says it's the basis of all his diets is yeah, eggs. eggs yeah and it's like rocky eats uh rocky, rocky eats raw, eats raw eggs whatever those guys yeah. are doing they're doing something right whatever yeah. these study guys i look at them i'm like yeah you're not doing it right yeah so if i'm going to follow somebody i mean so this is health. I mean, that's so, well, but, but, that's, I mean, but that's a, that goes to like, so what, um, what value does a university have? Well, somebody yeah. who's a science journalist should know how to evaluate a scientific research paper yeah, and should know how to accurately report its findings. And there's all kinds of good start to their career. Yeah. There's all kind of people who report on the sciences and they, you know, they, 
maybe they do know how and they but they also know they'll get more attention if they hype it up and or maybe they just don't so they there it is a real thing that people think statistically significant means like it mat like it's a lot like significant usually means oh it's a significant effect right like yeah. I, he ate eggs there's a significant relationship between eating eggs and having cholesterol you mean like what does that mean in in the mind of somebody who doesn't know that that's a special word <laughs> And it means like, yeah, yeah, eggs will give me really bad cholesterol. Not that we looked at a thousand people and, you know, the people that ate eggs had like a tenth of a point higher on some cholesterol measure. And hmm. like that doesn't matter, but it might matter in the sense of we can measure it. Yeah. So there's like two. So one thing. My, so my concern based on what we were saying earlier is that scientists would waste their time on this. But it sounds like they know most good. I mean, most relevant, important scientists doing something important would hopefully be able to quickly identify this kind of garbage. Yeah. I, and that's the, that's my official term. Right. <laughs> I'm going to add that to the lexicon of scientific knowledge. I mean, in epistemology. Yeah, I, it's it's not that it, they know it's garbage, but it's also a question of are they producing garbage? So like, I don't mm. think they are. I think what's. I mean the scientists. I mean, on the whole, it's not that there's never. It's not that garbage doesn't get published, but it's, yeah. but it's on the kind of thing that that we're worried about right now, like these. But that's what the public sees too. That's yeah. The that's issue. part they of see that's, this, that's not at the that's you know, that's at the um that's not at the knowledge generation level. That's at the dissemination level. This is what this is Alex Epstein's yeah. knowledge systems knowledge systems yeah as, aspect of it, where when you go high enough. Or how, is it high or low enough or whatever? Well, and, and in between, you, there's there's kind of systematizers. So you get these. So you you, 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 you we both uh, we both spend some time in the gym. I'm sure we are both familiar with all kind of weird yeah. strategies for eating that you eat this thing at this time of day and all. Do, yeah. And it's people will try to systematize whole theories of liver eat, king of, of, well he's just a <laughs> he's just a complete fraud i, I yeah. have more now he's of, a fraud but before yeah, yeah. i don't know he was not <laughs> but the, but but there's a there's a strategy of eating i i, I did it for a couple a couple months um just, which strategy the... it's uh called carb backloading if you've ever heard of that carb backloading. yeah it's you it's not you backload one. high high um what's it uh gi uh no. carbs like really sugary things um, you, is that you, different than like carbo loading? Um, well, so the the strategy is you eat them towards the end of the day after you work out. Uh, I have definitely heard so, that. So they'll be more partitioned towards um, growth and recovery than fat storage. Yeah, I've heard um, that. And for that's sure. that's based, is that not true? You're saying? Well, it's <laughs> it's one of these things. <laughs> it's like it's thought. like it's like there's some research that shows small effects in this direction. Uh, but and, but then the really systematizer is like take that and they think oh now i know that there's this causal relationship yeah. and and i can devise some whole strategy of eating and then what it comes you know, and then by the time it's by the time that's disseminated towards bros in the gym it's like <laughs> oh man just you Who know are on eat, steroids eat, yeah <laughs> yeah but just eat a bunch of you know eat a bunch of sweets uh or you know eat, eat a bunch of donuts after you lift they're like um, oh, because they're trying to sell their. They're trying their to thing, backload yeah. their carbs. They're trying yeah. to get all their or their. Why aren't they trying to sell their system? Oh well, the, so that's, the, but that's, they're trying to make it more appealing. But the so, the, so there's like a when this is going wrong, there's like like so the research will be whatever. It's just the research, and then and then it's 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 valid or not, and then then it gets to the systematizers, and it gets garbled, and it gets farther from what was actually found, and then by the time it gets to the average dieter. It's just, it's not even, it's, it's worse than what the systematizer is saying. It's, yeah. I can just eat whatever donuts I want as long as I eat them at night. And like now I'm okay. Um, which yeah. is one kind of thing people say. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a, a real example. Um, which is dangerous and stupid. But yeah. Yeah. Generally speaking. Yeah. yeah. Um, but okay. That, but that's, but that's why, um, you know, epistemology is important because yes. that yeah. now we understand what's going on. You have that perspective that there's this breakdown in, the knowledge there's a whole system of the production and dissemination of knowledge and there's a breakdown why don't the journalists know better why don't science journalists learn any of this stuff and some of them do but what well, seems like them, the incentives a lot of them don't and then why are people who aren't knowledgeable of this writing these kind of art articles like i'm sure that like bona fide science journalists wouldn't 
right the kind of like eggs turn my blood into tar kind yeah. of thing. It's probably just somebody who doesn't know anything about this. Somebody just said, write this thing. There's this, you know, we got a PR release from some um, nutrition department at the local university, yeah. like write it up. And then. Well, and then there could be confusions with. Yeah. And then there's off, like, on top of that, there's just pure confusion. Because sometimes it seems to use statistics. And like, I'm thinking of like COVID stuff, for instance. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like there's a lot of confusion, even among quote unquote, legitimate doctors and scientists. And part of it seemed to be a misunderstanding of the studies that were being presented at various times. I mean, that's well, my limited understanding of what was going on. I mean, it's like there's so, people, well, there's, there's, there's scientists this... and doctors from all over the spectrum saying very different things. And they were doctors and scientists with legitimate degrees. And they were looking at the same studies, you know, like the, the whole ivermectin thing. Mm. And, you know, part of it is they didn't quite understand the study and the study wasn't finished because there was a big new study that had, that was going to be a meta study. And mm -hmm. that meta study showed what was really going on. And um, so well, that, to I, jump the gut, like someone should know that if they're a scientist and they're going to give advice, like take ivermectin or not, they should know that, well, these studies aren't sufficient yet. Right. I mean, I, I don't know about the particular case, whether it's really an issue of how people understand statistics. My understanding is that some of the ivermectin research was uh, fraudulent. So f fro so fraudulent research is different than like statistics. And, oh, I didn't hear that part. Yeah, there, there was... I thought some of it was like they were done in third world countries. They found out what really occurred was... Ivermectin is great. It's for tapeworms. Like that was the job. Oh, and the people were cured and, of tapeworms. So like the, yeah, that, cured, so that was really what was, and I, then that I've heard their body that. was naturally able. Right. The broad to, bodies were stronger because stronger. they were infected by tapeworms. I've, yeah. I've heard that too, but I've also read if, and uh, um, maybe there was some frauds as well. Yeah. So, so some studies having, uh, well, oh, cause that's the other thing. The meta study pointed out actually is there were some frauds, but that's partly because where the studies were done, which is in some third world countries where what the standards weren't as high. And so there was some, they were pointing out like these studies are fraudulent. Mm -hmm. That was part of the meta study. So if you, was, if you have fraudulent studies in the meta study, then the meta study is no good because the meta study is a study of st like, no, but they were finding that they were, that that's yeah. part of what they were discovering. Oh, you, they were doing, they were, okay. So maybe so, you're using meta. Maybe I'm using different. Yeah. Correct. So there's something called a meta study, which basically aggregates Aggregate. oh, similar see, just, data yeah, yeah. from a variety, from a, from a, from a, like a large number of studies. So it's like you combine all the Yeah. Data. So I, but if you're studying, so I, th I think I was reading about the yeah. study, the meta study yeah, in so an article that was are, composing it. Right. So if people, if what uh, people are doing is just, here's this study that was published. I wonder if this is a good one. You could yeah. think of that as like going to the meta level or something, yeah. but th there's actually a thing called a meta study that's something different. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Um, there yeah. was a meta study as well, but I, I think it was the latter, the the looking at these various studies and aggregating what was really going on. But anyway, the point is that people were giving advice about ivermectin before all the evidence was in, and mm -hmm. they were very adamant about it. And that, to me, seems part of this same dissemination and systematizers or whatever, or is it different? Um, I, I don't n know enough about the, like if you're asking specifically about what's going on with people advocating ivermectin and ivermectin and why is it because of confusion, incompetence, deception? Like I, I don't know enough to, okay. to be confident to answer any, my, sense which i'm not i don't want to claim certainty on is that it's people should know better which is more towards the deception the scientist the scientists the people people yeah. who are making these recommendations um but again I, I i don't that's my just preliminary judgment i mean if if i wanted to have certain i had to, have to really get into it and then i have a question to myself of could I even get to the point where I'm certain about this because I don't, you'd need to know more medicine. I think is this really something somebody should know better than to advocate? Like, mm. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know enough, but like, when do I know when, when, at what point does a doctor know enough to say you should do this? 
Yeah. Like okay. I'd have to know that too, to re- to really say, are people huh. doing something that's just um, mistaken um, or may- maybe another possibility is what they're, they're advocating something that's wrong, but reasonable. I mean, I just have yeah. to know a whole lot more. There's a lot of possibilities. Um, I've tended to read more, uh, you know, just based on who I know and follow on various social media, I tend to see the, the deceptions being pointed out more, more, yeah. a, and that could just be bias in my sourcing. Um, I or see. it could be, no, that could be really, so you have, yeah, you haven't done a systematic yeah. study yourself. Uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. No, I get that. You know, I, I was just curious because we were talking about these different types of studies that there's a process that has been, that Huell has kind of helped yeah. make and more prominent and more efficient and I was worrying about scientists today wasting their time because they do need to do one PhD to calibrate one part of a machine that does like, so then you want to be as efficient as possible to make all of that work more. Mm -hmm. But then of course the dissemination is also critical because you know, we're having a more more anti-science world. If you want, if you want to use, if you want to use, I, I would, I would be cautious of taking, um, here's the kind of social sociology of science lessons you can take. You know, I still think we have to wait a good 10 years before we can have the kind of hindsight. That's not clouded for COVID for COVID. That's not like clouded by all the politics, all the things that seem really important right now that in 20 years from now will just be baffling to people. Why who weren't in the thick of it. Um, but also like, when when the public doesn't really have a stake in scientific research and when being on one side or the other side of some scientific debate doesn't get you called a fascist or something, um, science is really messy and hard and people fight and are controversial and don't talk to themselves. Yeah. And then now it's in this, it's like that same thing, just magnified a thousandfold. People are not talking to each other. Yeah, and they won't because you, they're you know, scared. Of- you you took ivermectin. You can't. Come, I'm gonna. You know. You can't come to Thanksgiving or, or you that kind of that kind of. You were opposed to lockdowns, so that means you're this, and you advocated lockdowns. That means you're you're that. I mean, you can't take a crisis example and think. Oh, this is going to be a core data point for my theory of, um, like, how scientific journals should run or something along those lines. You okay? It's the wrong level of analysis. Basically. Yeah, you you want to form when when people are more level headed. But I'm more considered yeah. concerned, based on what you were saying, with scientists wasting their time, because I want them to be more efficient. Is what we're trying to get to with what you were studying or you're teaching. Oh, sure. Right? Because if they're more efficient, then I live longer. Right? If they're yeah. better at their job and they have better tools, then I get to live a little bit longer, hopefully. Yeah, I mean... Because they cure cancer faster. Like, th- is, that, is that correct? In terms of... If they're well, wasting their I mean, time that's, that's going the down value, wrong... What, like, what's the value of the epistemology of science and the sociology that's of science? That's what I'm saying, yeah. Is to, is to make... It more efficient, more efficient, less error prone, but not just like that is one of the, but also, um, there are certain things maybe we couldn't discover if we didn't know how to do science Yeah, and there's more things to learn about how to do science. And that's what I'm yeah. mostly concerned with. Yeah. So there's Societal two things, ones so is another thing of course, do it, but. doing, doing what we already know how to do better and then doing things we don't know how to do at all yet. Um, yeah. so, so there was a period of time where there was a question is, Maybe maybe we shouldn't do experiments because like we're trying to figure out the way nature is and you're intervening. That's kind of cheating, isn't it? You're setting things up to go a certain way hmm. when they wouldn't go that way naturally to begin with. So maybe experimental research is not the right approach. Maybe you just have to more passively observe nature. Be a much longer process, I would imagine. Yeah, or, and, and well, like you, you're talking I, I mean, about like rodents, a, for instance, like well, I, getting hundreds of rodents and doing something that kills hundreds of them or something. Um, or I different? mean, I mean, like uh, I want to know what free fall, how free fall works. Uh, let's evacuate all the air out of a tower and drop something from it. Okay, that's cheating because free fall doesn't, you know, doesn't occur in a vacuum. Isn't that cheating? 
So do you mean free fall as in free fall, like jumping off an Empire State Building free fall? Or just dropping something from a height. Yeah. Or putting bacteria in a petri dish. Bacteria don't live in petri dishes; they live in the body. Oh, I see. Okay. Like, so like all of any any kind of manipulation or intervention in order to figure out how something works isn't yeah. really figuring out how it works naturally. Yeah. It's cheating. It's manipulating nature. To that's the way. So you study the plague when there's a plague. You take the bodies and you're like, oh, this is a plague body, and but there's it, an actual it's not, plague. And it's not. It's not like an ethical point. Like it's cheating. It's a epistemological cheating. Like huh. that's not how nature really behaves on its own. Oh, like that, that's the kind of, that's the kind of, um, uh, it feels like that's an excuse though for an ethical point. But, but the point is that that's not, no, the point isn't like we should revive this debate. It's, it's just that, yeah, that's how some people like thought about it. And yeah. there was a period of time where you just, people just didn't do experiments and, uh, there were also ethical reasons not to do specific experiments, like um, don't do autopsies, don't cut mm. open bodies. Like that's ethical, not epistemological. Stem cell research. Yeah. Now, now stem cell research. Now we don't do vivisection now usually. Yeah. Certainly not on people. Like yeah. if you if you weren't worried about ethics, you could learn a whole lot more about h- human bodies and behavior if you just treated human beings like literal lab rats. Like by the way, this is nineteenth century science fiction. 19th just, century science. What you just said. Uh, vivisection and... If you don't care about oh, morality... Well, oh, really? Learn, oh, okay. You can learn anything. That is, I think, I would say... Well, it's not that you can learn anything. It's that you can no, learn the, cer- certain things more rapidly. I know. Like, that's how yeah. you as a scientist put yeah, it, but this yeah. is how a literature person... Oh, would put it. Okay. Would put it. It's yeah, like, yeah. they, you know, you can... The, the, sci- the mad scientist of Dr. Frankenstein and... Uh, Dr. Rappaccini and there's you know several others incl- and the H.D. Wells and others. That's what they were oh, obsessed I, with. I they see. were obsessed with knowledge and the, the attainment of knowledge at all costs. Yeah. And they didn't care about the morality. Okay. And that was the point. And that's what they had to learn or, you know, destroy them. A oh, I see. I see. I and see. so what you just said is the basis of 19th century and a lot of modern science fiction, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. But anyway, yeah, I agree. So that's a separate subject, yeah. but I finally knew something you were talking about. <laughs> but sure, so I guess I guess the point I was getting at is like at, at some point people didn't know even should we do an exp- like a basic idea we get you manipulate nature in order to reveal its secrets yeah um, should we do that is that somehow going to lead us astray or will that lead us closer to the truth eventually it's decided that it's decided because people start doing this and it's obviously that it, it's obviously productive. Um, and then there's a question, how do you do it? How do you do it better? And now we talk, like if you talk to research scientists, there's actually a, um, uh, 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 a, it's not really funny to me, but a Big Bang episode, Big Bang Theory. I know the show, I've yeah, never yeah. seen it. There's I'm one where there's two, two of the people are arguing about who's a better scientist. <clears throat> and one of them says, you don't even, you wouldn't know a confounding variable if it, bit you on your slide rulers, you know, some kind of, <laughs> some kind of geek, geek, geek talk, talk yeah, geek yeah. insult. But it's like, yeah, the idea of a confounding variable that you have to control for when you design an experiment, like that's all somebody had to figure that out. And before you knew that you could still, it's not like you didn't, couldn't learn anything from science or from an experiment, but it's, um, you can't learn as much. And mm-hmm. we don't have, or at least there's no reason to think we have, um, methodological omniscience about science so there's there's we know that we don't know a whole lot of things about how we can do science better and uh, a good epistemology of science would um, help us do that and then on the sociological side like is peer review productive i mean i I, i've (laughs) my my sense of i mean in the in in the sciences put uh, in the hard sciences put aside like uh, i think it's a joke in in the humanities um, but yeah. put it, put it, put it, the hard sciences and like what it's supposed to do is, well, there's certain agreed upon standards for what a good, um, statistical analysis of the, of data, blah, blah, blah is. Um, and it turns out that bad stuff gets through peer review, like just ba- yeah, bad, even bad basics, sciences. even though it gets through all the time. And it's not clear that it's the peer review does anything other than make researchers have to go through the peer review hurdle. So I read something recently It was pretty convincing that what would be better is if everybody just forgot about peer review and posted things on, there's a website called, um, I think you say it archive, but it's spelled like A R 
I X something. It's where physicists and mathematicians and computer scientists post like pre publication prints. I see. And the idea is just to ever put your stuff up there and with that people read your abstract and then read the paper and forget about the peer, you know, cause stuff gets through peer review. That's wrong all the time. So all that's doing is wasting everybody's time when we can just read papers on our own. And that's the kind of review is just, Oh, this is a good result and it looks valid. So I'm going to, now, peer review is like multiple people peer reviewing it, not just one person. The, the, the way it works in uh, let's in um, blinded peer review is uh, you have a journal, the Journal of Podcast Research, and <laughs> I, true. I submit I'm launching a, it today. You're the editor of it. I submit a paper to you on how to do a good podcast, and um, as the editor, you uh, assign my paper to some um reviewers you say three and you don't you, you either i prepare it this way or you you do it um you make it so you can't identify the author of yeah. the paper and you give it to these people it's a blind read they don't know who wrote the paper even though it's easy it's trivially easy most of the time to figure out who it is anyway yeah because. syntax and style and or, you know, there's like two people doing research on, on this, this one yeah, thing. Okay, yeah, so. okay, even easier. Or you just Google three lines from the paper and the paper's already online yeah. somewhere and you just see. So it's it's already a little bit of a joke. Um, but the idea is, you know, this removes biases. So if somebody who hates me happens to review my paper, they don't know it's by me, so they won't hold that against it. They'll just give a, give a review of the content. So and there's then, no thought that goes into who's doing the peer reviewing? Um, it's supposed to be people who are experts in the thing being reviewed. Got it. Now in philosophy, well, let's yeah, so, put let's aside science, philosophy. Yeah. yeah. So that and and I don't know in the sciences does that actually happen to, consistently? Do they always give it to people who know the material? Well, or what does that mean? Yeah. Like, and what, what is it? Level? And and the editors, are these people who are just not busy enough with their real work and they're no, it's it's guilty. I mean, uh, I mean, so that's part of the problem is that you don't get paid to do this. Yeah. It doesn't help you get tenure. Well, as a what's, writer, what's the incentive to do it? You kind of feel like guilt. You publish all the time and you feel guilty about it. Or maybe somebody sends you a paper and it seems really interesting, the paper. So you think, yeah. oh, I'm going to read this anyway. I might as well write this guy two paragraph review or something like that. Yeah. So um, so there's a question about, but, you know, there's everybody knows about the hoaxes on the humanities journal journals where they send goofy fake papers to, uh, you know, the journal of. Um, yeah, yeah, gender yeah. studies about like how dogs are toxic mental masculinity at the yeah. dog park or whatever. Yeah. Um, and they're fake papers and they get peer reviewed and they get published. But there's similar things in, in the sciences where they'll send out papers that have fabricated data and nobody notices yeah. or that commit major, commit major statistical errors and nobody notices. Um, I was under the impression that if you, uh, we're going to publish a paper where you had, you know, collected a bunch of data. You had to also provide the data. And that's not, that's not, always, the, case? That's not always the case. <laughs> um, that's crazy. Usually you have to uh, give it over on, on a request, but like, what's the penalty if you don't? Yeah. Um, well, and they may not even request all the time. Yeah. Right. Like that the assumption is sometimes enough, right? Yeah. Like you think you might have to, so, Oh, we won't do it because they know they have to. And, so the, the question is like, what the hell is the point of all of all of this? Yeah. It seems like just a big burden Jeez. on people. And then people write things. Now, when you're writing this research or doing this research, you're partially thinking, will this pass peer review? That's part of it's now shaping how you do the research. And there's another motive in addition to just I want to solve this problem or figure it out. Or and there's in, now there's incentives to spin research one way or the other or outright fabricate or fudge. Yeah. Um, so the, I think there, and then, and then on top of that, there's a kind of question of, well, the original, um, motivation for this system was that it would make research better. So people have done research on, does this actually make things better? And the, the answer seems to be probably not. And if it does, it's so marginal that the question is, is this worth the cost? Yeah. Um, uh, it, it, there's something, well, something I'd like to learn more about is this claim that um, there's been a noticeable, measurable, and not just it, like significant in the in the ordinary sense of the word, significant slowdown in the production of new theoretical knowledge since um, mm. about the, the mid 20th century, which will also coincide, you know, there's, 
then the, if that's true, the question is what's the cause of that or cause is, it could be, there's multiple things. going. It's also around the time that peer review starts yeah. going like none of the early, you know, none of Einstein papers uh, were peer reviewed. None of the early quantum mechanics papers yeah, were peer Darwin reviewed. Was was Darwin, not. Darwin was not peer reviewed. Yeah. Newton is not. Uh, most of that was done, but there were magazines and journals that you'd publish in. It's just not a peer review. The editor would just say, this looks interesting. And I um, think peer, re- like, I, I can't imagine peer reviewing as possibly very beneficial. And and this just from my not yeah. like my not knowing anything about it and, but hearing you talk about it even for a few seconds, because I could just make an analogy or a comparison to like writing fiction and getting people's feedback on it. Yeah. And it's in a similar way where even if they're good fiction writers, that doesn't mean that they're understanding what I'm trying to accomplish with this fiction piece. And that's part of, there's a whole context that goes into it and there's everything else. And they would have to like be a part of it, not just read, you know, this casually on the side when Mm -hmm. they're doing other things and they're not getting paid for it. Motivations are all wrong. Uh, I mean, I think about this all the time with writing fiction, reading fiction is like, um, you know, I know I could put, if I were to put my name on something famous that that people I, like you hadn't read. And I said, "Give me feedback on this." You'd probably tear it apart and do. And I was like, "That's one of the most famous Nathaniel Hawthorne short stories of all time, and it's amazing yeah. work of art." And you know, like people have a fundamentally different perspective when they're reviewing something, mm-hmm. one way or the other, than when they're digesting it. And it seems like a better model, like, is what Ayn Rand did with her editing, which is she would get editors' feedback, but she was the arbiter. Mm-hmm. of what went in and didn't and what changed and didn't. And that seems to be make the most sense. It's like maybe the person could put it out for some feedback, but they're the ones mm-hmm. figuring out what's good and yeah. bad about yeah. the review because a review can be good or bad, just like an article could be good or yeah. bad. Yeah, I mean, c- complaints about incompetent reviewers, if you follow, um, like I follow people in, in on philosophy Twitter. So I don't know. There's a philosophy Twitter. There's a philosophy Twitter. There's an everything Twitter. There's an everything, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's a little bit like, of a like, like the, the reviewer will say this person obviously doesn't understand the work of Professor uh, Smith. Lo and behold, they're reviewing a paper by Professor Smith. So it's like that's the that, best. Thing I, I, I mean, it, it, that, <laughs> that's like so awesome. Um, <laughs> or the the reviewer will insist <laughs> that something that isn't mistake is a mistake, and then now there's a question of like, okay, how does this get resolved? Because the reviewer clearly doesn't understand this well enough to be reviewing it. Yeah. Is it the editor has to, like, is the editor going to do the right thing and like make a decision or, but then that seems to go against the peer review thing because the editor is not supposed to be doing it. It's you give it to the peer reviewers to review and they, they give that anyway. Um, yeah. So I, I think there's a real question about whether or not that's a sensible system, even in, in the, in the hard, hard sciences yeah and in the humanities it is well, the humanities de- it's definitely obviously it's, de- it's obviously a joke even to people in the humanities yet what keeps it around i think in 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 large part is that uh when you go up for tenure you have to prove your worth in some sense yeah and you're also you're often proving your worth to people who are not not just people your peers in your field but like the dean and uh, yeah. board and uh, external reviewers and there's also reviewers from other fields and they don't really have the equipment to evaluate whether or not your research is good. So they either just have to completely defer to the judgment of the people who are actually in your field or you know what they can do is, okay, you published in journals and I, can, I don't understand physics, but I know what a top physics journal is. You published in the top physics. Is there, is there a kind of that is part of the the supposed value of it is that it's a way to like objectively show to outsiders that you're in fact knowledgeable in your field. Yeah. I think there's actually something to that. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that needs to be accomplished by peer review. It can just be accomplished by, well, I mean now it's be now you could just do it by like citation counts or how often your papers downloaded from a website. Um, you know, if everybody in your field cites your paper, obviously that's an important paper and you're an, uh, a knowledgeable person. Um, if nobody cites your paper... That's influence. 
So but that's a, you're that's a pro, that's you're a measuring influence. Yeah, the the question the question so, though is for how can an outsider judge that you're actually an expert in your field? And one way is to just defer to other people in your field who you already accept as ex, in the field that you already accept as experts. Well, then how do you? Yeah. So how out? do you, how do you get them? And then, um, well, that's that's another question. But if if you had some kind of um, system which is the idea of peer review is that it's blind, like yeah. blind peer review. So you're not just getting published because you have all the right connections. You're getting well, published because yeah. of the quality of that's the ideal. That's but not, it's, but it's, yeah, it, it still sounds like it doesn't work. It's giving um, you the, uh, the false, it's like faux confidence in this, the value of this versus like, you know, having really high standards for what, looks like good science i think that makes more sense to me yeah the, that, the, as having like would, objective standards for what they would they would say i mean in the question there's a question of who is they because everybody seems to have a problem with the system everybody you ask yeah um but the a defense of this system would say yeah i mean peer review is supposed to embody those standards so the point of reviewing it is that somebody who knows the standards applies them to the paper and they say, okay, this, um, you know, they didn't do the data gathering correctly. They committed this mistake. They didn't control for an obvious confounding variable. They forgot to carry the two, it, it, all that kind of stuff. That's um, what the review is, reviewer might catch. That might be the value of peer review. And that things that create commit obvious mistakes don't get the there through this filter. That would if it if that actually worked, that would be a valuable thing. Then you wouldn't read papers that had obvious mistakes in them. And even if it was a good paper, it would get caught that had the obvious mistake. The mistake would get fixed. And then mm. it would be an even better paper. But yeah. it turns out the things that have obvious mistakes get through all the time. Um, you know the 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 thought that. Um, where the claim that vaccines cause autism, cause autism mm -hmm. came from a peer review paper that was retract was retracted like a decade later, because yeah. it was never a good study to begin with, but it got through, and then now that you have this system, it creates like a kind of prestige effect around things that make it through. Yeah. So this is supposedly legitimate research, yeah. even though it was never legitimate research. It was just a, a mistake that it got through because it was bad to begin with, um, but now it has you know. Now, and you know, it's a conspiracy. That's why it was retracted, not because it was bad. But you can understand why a normal, you know, person, uneducated, you know, I don't mean that in a bad way, just like not gone to school or college, working class might feel that way. Yeah, because there's they don't peer, understand. And it's yeah. like, well, why? But they if there was no peer review system, then you couldn't yeah. say this. It, it, like you would have it would um, if there it, there might be some other proxy for like value. Um but one thing that the peer review system um, makes possible is for people to say this made it through peer review and that like legitimizes it. Yeah. And I mean. But this is so dangerous. Yeah. So just because like, I, wasn't there something recently about an Alzheimer's premise? Um, there was some premise oh. from 30 years ago that got through and every, it was the premise. It was everyone, assumed by everybody. Yeah, it was assumed by everybody. Yeah. And it's like, this is what I was talking about. And we should probably wrap up here yeah. in a minute, but it's, but it, this is, this is why I'm worried about it. Why I think what you're doing is important. And, you know, maybe the, is because people made all this, you know, just to wrap up that thought, mm. just all these scientists had this assumption that was based on his peer review paper. And that, put all this research in the wrong uh, ven ven avenue. Mm -hmm. They were all going on the wrong road. And now they're finally starting over. So we've lost 30 years or 20 yeah. or whatever it was of time. And people have died and gone through Alzheimer's. And it's like, you know, that's, 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 this is a huge, you know, when, when you are making the argument of what is the value of what you do in a snapshot, to me, that's it. Yeah. Is this is this issue of like these people are going down the wrong path for th whatever period of time because they had the wrong epistemology mm -hmm. and they didn't they didn't we weren't fast enough at improve because nothing yeah, is going to be know. perfect. I don't, right? I don't know. That, I don't know that. Like I, I remember well, top, reading about I'm saying like, reading about it, but yeah. 
you do have to like no no matter how even even like total epistemological omniscience is not going to stop. There's no such thing as like flawless. Yeah, there's no such thing as people aren't going to make mistakes anymore. But you want to get there faster, is what I'm saying, and I think. Yeah, but there's a but there's no guarantee that some like field might go off the rails for 30 years. Like that's and, and that's there's true. there's also there's certain things that I I just don't think there's any solution to other than. Um, people have to uh, value intellectual honesty. Like um, the forensic field of bite mark analysis to me. Bite? Bite mark, mark analysis. Like where they try to match a victim's bite, like the bite on a body of somebody who was murdered. They say yeah. these are teeth and these match. Ted Bundy. That's how they match. got Ted Bundy. Yeah, but that whole thing is pseudoscience. Yeah. Um, and Not there that was, I've heard that. There was a great expose of this in the Washington Post. I think it was Post Ted Bundy, wasn't it? By um, Rad- Radley Balco, I think wrote this. Sounds like something he would write. Uh, I wish I, I didn't realize we were. Gonna, I, I didn't imagine this would come up, so I can't remember exactly. I mean, it, but, you know, yeah, yeah, but 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 the point is just that there's a whole field, and they give each other degrees and certifications, and the whole thing is. is um, I mean, the reason I th- what convinced me that this is all garbage is that they got a whole bunch of people that are supposedly experts in bite marks, and they showed them a bunch of different you know, cases to, and they looked and these people were no better getting than, than chance at getting it right. And they were like, the experts were contradicting each other. And yet people are going to jail, um, based on this kind of testimony. And, but now you, and this, then the standards for what scientific evidence in the courts are is, is there, it's, it's something like, is there a field of people that have certification and there's no way to get outside of some, of some field once it's going and say that this whole field is legitimate is illegitimate. Um, so this kind of perpetuates itself and there's nothing that, that can, can like, there's no epistemology that I think that can stop that at the level of, there's always going to be astrologists. There's always going to be pseudoscientists. Um, what you can do is more marginalize them by adopting better standards. Um, but there's not going to be like some, um, some discovery in epistemology that'll make it so that um, mistakes don't happen and people aren't d- dishonest. Yeah, but there's okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I know, I know we're trying to wrap up, but there's one. There's something that is, is still sticking with me on this is that th- there seems to be fundamental difference between the two different the the pseudoscience and the oh this is science mm-hmm. this is correct way of doing it. But no, it's not. And now we've gone down 30 years because of this. I see. So like that's that sounds very different to me. Um, like I understand yeah. pseudoscience. I mean, when I, you did. I, I need to know the, to actually s- say anything about that case. But, but even based on what yeah. you've said about peer review, that is you could forget the Alzheimer's example. Well, the, you could the, see that, how like a peer yeah. reviewed article could be very influential. People could start accepting it because it's peer because reviewed. It's peer reviewed yeah. And because and then they're going down this road of cancer research. And it's the wrong road, yeah. and they're they're not checking it again because it's already been peer reviewed. Yeah. I mean, peer- that's different than like pseudoscience. Like, wait a second, this guy's just making this crap up as yeah. he's going, right? Well, peer, like, peer, re- totally peer review is supposed to be it's a technology to implement good epistemology. Yeah. Okay. That's my. It's, it's like it's, and, it's, and it's, the it question, sells itself yeah. as the a question healthy is, is this is this item. a good is this a good is <laughs> this a good, is this a good technology to implement? epistemology and the yeah i think ultimately the way you answer that is the kind of um how often do mistakes get through um how glaring of a mistake gets through how often um how often does this does the alzheimer's type thing happen i mean if it happens like once in a blue moon uh maybe that's but uh, it prevents a whole lot of worse things from happening maybe then it is valuable overall. So I, I don't want to, like, I'm a peer review skeptic, but I don't want to say opposition to peer review is not purely um, philosophical. It's also, it's like a cost-benefit um, I see. thing because it's a it's a piece of, it's a way to implement a certain, uh, certain epistemological standards. The epistemological, good epistemological standards could be poorly, uh, implemented. Yeah. Well, and I understand that you haven't done a systematic review of peer reviews as yeah. a system. Yeah. So we're, you're, we're kind of going off the cuff of yeah. our knowledge yeah. of this. And, and I, I should but, say my, my, 
uh, my skepticism of it is more um, based in my knowledge of it in the humanities than it is like what I what I, like, I think it's clear in the humanities. What I what, but it's I'm kind of like what it's it's really it's really bad here, and that's kind of influencing how I'm I like see. the light like I'm shining on the you know, emotional. You know, I'm, yeah, my yeah. emotional attachments, and yeah. I'm you know I'm taking more seriously criticisms of it than the defenses, and I'm trying to you know f- think of how somebody might defend it. Uh, but I think ultimately it, it, it's more a technological question, like. Um, you know, the kind of things that come up with social media are similar. Like, look at how fast disinformation spreads. And like, it, it, isn't that um, something bad about social media? But then you can, on the other hand, you can say, um, yeah, but look how f- quickly good information can spread. And it's, yeah. So on the whole, is this, Velocity is, 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 yeah, is this, bad enough is this um, a, a positive or a negative for the dissemination of knowledge? And I mean, that's okay. If, if the, bad is so is like if the bad stuff that gets spread through social media tends to we all like people who care about the truth like notice that and are really upset about it and maybe you're just not noticing how much good stuff has spread because of it that Mm -hmm. it just kind of sits in the background well and you could also choose to spread good stuff yeah (laughs) i think people okay so um I think that's that's good. We've solved science <laughs> at this point. And no, there's a lot to talk about. I hope you'll come back at some point. Sure. I guess the last very light question is what is, you know, so what's inspiring you? What do you want to work on? You know, is it just a closing, closing thing? Um, what I'm most interested in working on presently is um, some of what we've already talked about. Uh, I'm, I'd like to write something based on the course I taught on Huell and Herschel and Darwin, um, they're partially based. It, uh, the article would discuss the importance and value of philosophy of science to practicing scientists and the kind of, um, uh, historical, uh, evidence in favor of that thesis would be in part that it's had a positive impact on people like Darwin. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in writing some of the, uh, some of the Rand scholarship type articles that go in the Ayn Rand society, philosophical, uh, studies, uh, books. Um, Is it like, for professors. Yeah. That, like well, for it's, for, it's, it's for, I think of it as for, um, students of philosophy more. Okay. Uh, that's the part that would, but it's not I, the general public type. It's of not article. the general public okay. uh, type of article. The philosophy of science article I just mentioned, I'd pitch towards scientists and science journalists and people who are consumers of science. Um, yeah. Yeah. That sort of audience. So again, not a general audience. Um, ultimately I'd like to write a book on the foundations of science, okay. uh, causality and laws of nature and, um, metaphysics of science. Uh, that's a the more metaphysics of, a, of science. science. That's more of a long term like causality. What what is a cause, oh, what see. is a cause and um, how understanding what that a me- cause okay, is okay, influences yeah, yeah. the kind of uh, yeah. methods we use to discover them. Uh, that that sort of uh, topic. So that's that's a kind of long term project. So. All right. So. Well, that's. I hope you get started on that. And <laughs> I hope so too. Your Ocon talk will be about one of those topics. Yeah, some it'll level, be. A, it'll be about uh, what. What is an explanation? What is an explanation? Yeah, we use that word all the time. What is that? What oh, is, I like that. Uh, what does that mean? What uh, What makes an explanation good versus not? You should good? do that at the beginning of Ocon, or maybe even before, <laughs> because people are always trying to explain, explain things, things. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know if this makes any sense. Yeah. Even though you say it in a very intelligent way, yeah. so. Very good. All right, Mike. Well, thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.